Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial of their service at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And to get there, you go to audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. This week, we're doing a best of episode of 2017, but we have so many dinosaur requests that we're going to do one of those anyway. (laughs) So our dinosaur of the day this week is Draco Raptor, and we have all of our best ofs, like I said. And then, as always, we would like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons. This week, we would like to thank Scotty, Jackson, Megan Dixon, Kessler, Tristan Jules, and Grandpa Dino. And Grandpa Dino has been a patron at the Tyrannosaurus level for quite a while and just joined the Stegosaurus level. And we're now going to open up the Stegosaurus feature of getting a shout out to anybody at the above tiers as well. So if you're interested in getting a shout out and you're at either the Triceratops or the Tyrannosaurus or the Spinosaurus tier, just let us know and we'll add you to the list. We hadn't done it before because we edited out the shout outs and ads from theoretically everybody <laughs> at the Triceratops level and above, or at least they have that option, but some people don't listen to the ad-free version even though they're at that level. So anyway, long story short, anybody can get a shout out at the Stegosaurus level and above now. Yay, 2018! Woo, changes! Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate all of your messages and support and dinosaur requests and everything. And we plan on keeping this thing going in 2018. Yeah, this, this marks our third completed year of the podcast. And we definitely couldn't have done it without you. So if you want to join this growing group of amazing people, then check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Jumping into our best of, we're going to kick it off with the best discovery of the year. This one is a notosaur, so it doesn't have the tail club. And it was recently released by the Royal Tyrrell Museum. They put out a bunch of pictures and they've also put it in a new exhibit. And thanks to Chris, Joaquin, Kyle, Ampersand Brew, Janice, Brett, and Phil for sharing this with us on Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, email, and Instagram. So this specimen, they're calling, quote, the best preserved armored dinosaur in the world, end quote. (laughs) Possibly a loftier goal they're going for there. And although it is better preserved, likely, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell since so much of the other ankylosaur is still buried in this rock. It's definitely not as complete because, like I said, they don't have the tail at all. But they think the way that it got preserved so well is that it got swept out to sea really quickly and then almost immediately buried and also on its back. Oh. <laughs> so both of these guys kind of like turtles on their back. <laughs> oh, no. Is that... <laughs> that they're undoing may have contributed sure (laughs) i think it was probably just because they're kind of top heavy with all that bone and weight on the top but anyway this one like i said is a notosaur so it doesn't have a tail club it was found about 250 miles or 400 kilometers northeast of edmonton alberta and that puts it much closer to the northwest territories in canada than to the u.s border and it's significantly farther north than even Grand Prairie, where Sabrina and I went, which felt like driving to the moon. It was so far (laughs) from everything. Yeah. But a lot of times that's where the good dinosaur discoveries are, because there's, you know, a lot of open space to do some excavating. And in this case, it was discovered in 2011 when a worker at the Suncor Millennium Mine noticed a strange brown circle pattern in a hard piece of rock (laughs) that fell off a cliff. That's great. Yeah. So he stopped working and called over a supervisor, and eventually they called the Royal Tyrrell Museum in to check it out. And it turned out to be cleaved osteoderms that kind of just give this polka dot pattern to the rock. And it's pretty interesting looking. So they spent a couple weeks 
in the quarry, the Royal Tyrol Museum, and a whole bunch of people that, you know, generally work in the quarry, helping them to excavate this thing. And they kind of excavated all the way around it until they had this little pedestal looking thing sticking up out of the ground. And then they drilled a couple of tunnels underneath that pedestal like thing and shoved logs under it. And then they used high pressure water to blast off underneath it to kind of separate it. So now you have this separate chunk. And then they hooked it up to a crane and tried to lift it up as one solid piece but unfortunately, when they lifted it, the block shattered into a whole bunch of pieces. And that's all in this video that Suncor put together because they were kind of doing a little documentary of it while they were excavating it. And it's like, it's heartbreaking when you see this thing break because you're just like, oh no, <laughs> why? But luckily, it kind of broke into large pieces. It didn't just crumble. They're pretty big pieces, and it ended up exposing some preserved tendons and other bits and pieces that they probably wouldn't have seen otherwise, so it wasn't all bad. The dinosaur hasn't been peer-reviewed yet, although they are saying that it's a new genus and species, and there's a fair amount of information in a National Geographic article, as well as a FAQ sheet for the new Grounds for Discovery exhibit, which just opened at the Royal Tyrrell Museum. And they say that it's completely preserved from the snout to the hips. So that's kind of that half of the ankylosaur that they got. And they don't have much of the bottom, although they do have two of the feet. They have the right front foot and the left hind foot, I think. Because of the way it was buried on its yeah. back? And I think it's also just, you know, like maybe not all of it got buried or maybe something managed to eat a little bit of it that was sticking out or mm -hmm. something like that. It's always kind of hard to tell. Or it could just be that there are sometimes differences in the geology. So not all of the rock around it was good for fossilization. Part of it might have been in a different type of rock. So that part just rotted away rather than fossilizing. They say it's the oldest known dinosaur from Alberta at 110 to 112 million years old, putting it kind of in the middle of the Cretaceous. They also have a huge amount of fossilized skin and osteoderms. And actually, there's so much fossilized skin and osteoderms that it blocks the skeleton from being studied. <laughs> and if you look at pictures of this thing, it is so amazing. And that's why so many people shared this with us, because these pictures are just astonishing. It's got the head, and it literally looks like you know, a taxidermy animal or something. It basically looks like how you'd expect to see an ankylosaur. It's got all of its scutes sticking out in all the right places and the skin impressions and the detail. Like I said, there's even eyelids. Yeah, it just looks like a statue. It's amazing. It's really the coolest looking find I think I've ever seen. I'm not sure. The other one might be better once they get it out of the rock because sure. it's more complete. But this one would be really hard to beat. It's just amazing. Well, National Geographic also has this 3D interactive view, which oh, yeah. is pretty cool. Yeah, it's really great. And you have to do it on a phone, I think. I tried doing it on my computer a couple of times. But on, on a phone, you scroll up and it pops up with little graphics and it tells oh. you about what the different spots do. I was able to do that on my laptop. Oh, nice. Just scroll, yeah. Cool. So it would probably work on your computer too. It's really great. It like spins around and it shows you all these different details and information about it. It's definitely worth looking at. But they really weren't satisfied with just looking at preserved skin because most of what we know about dinosaurs comes from the bones. And unfortunately, CT scans have failed to penetrate through that Aww. fossilized osteoderm kind of structure. Um, I'm thinking they need to get it into a synchrotron and crank up that CT power a couple orders of magnitude, but it might be too big for that because it is huge and heavy and obviously a little bit fragile too that when they lifted it up, it split. You don't want to move it around too much. Mm -hmm. They did manage to do some chemical tests on the skin and from that, they believed that it was probably reddish with lighter osteoderms. And I think that might be what the Saurian group was talking about when they said their ankylosaur was the most accurate representation. Because hmm. theirs is pretty reddish and it has lighter colored osteoderms on it. Oh, but they wouldn't say what about it was more accurate. Sure. So I think they might have gotten some inside hints for their ankylosaurus. They say that the huge block, I think their block weighed about seven tons. So really small potatoes compared to some of these other blocks. <laughs> <laughs> they say that it took about 7,000 hours of preparation time to prepare it. And after about a month, they'd only prepared an area about the size of a piece of paper, 
which isn't too surprising considering how much detail and how carefully you want to go through an amazing find like this. You don't want to over prepare and accidentally remove some pieces. Yep. On both of its shoulders, it has a 20 inch or half a meter long spike, which just looks amazing. I think that's without a keratin sheath, but it might actually still have the keratin sheath on it because some of the osteoderms still have their keratin sheaths on them, hmm. which is also amazing. We talk all the time about how things like therizinosaurs had these huge claws, but they actually had even bigger claws because they had these keratin sheaths over them like modern animals do. But unfortunately, that's almost never preserved. In this case, it is, because <laughs> why not? It's so well preserved. On the foot, at least one of the feet in the National Geographic tour, they show that there's a foot pad preserved on one of the bottoms of the feet, which is basically that fleshy part that cushions the foot when it's walking. So we oh. can see yeah, a little more detail about what its feet looked like. That's cool. Yeah. And then uh, on top of that, the whole skin has the skin impression, so we can see the scales on the foot itself, as well as most of the rest of the animal. We can see tiny hints of some of the bones, so the skin kind of collapsed onto the dinosaur, which we see a lot in these fossilized dinosaurs. The skin tends to kind of fall onto the skeleton. Shrink think, wraps itself. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I think in this case it happened a little bit less because it has all those osteoderms, and since those kind of preserved... You know, I think that kind of kept a lot more of the structure, but you can see little bits of vertebrae poking up through the back of the osteoderms and the outline of the shoulder blades are partially visible too. So there's a little bit of the skeleton we can kind of see. And then Sabrina's really going to like this. When the specimen broke apart, they also got a look at the gut contents. Oh, nice. <laughs> They didn't hazard a guess at what it was. They just said they were, quote, pea-sized pieces, and they were going to do some chemical analysis on it to try to figure out what it was. It seems very small. Yeah, but if you imagine it probably had a gizzard, you know, maybe had some gastrolis in there to grind it up. Yeah, that's an amazing find. It doesn't look like it's been peer-reviewed yet, maybe because they couldn't see the skeleton, so it's really hard to compare to other ankylosaurs. You know, it's not like we can compare this amazingly well-preserved skin and scute pattern to other ankylosaurs because it's, you know, one of maybe two that exists like that. So you really need to see the, the bones to get a good idea. <laughs> they might be able to do it based on the head because a lot of the taxonomy comes from the skull ornamentation, but we'll have to see. Hopefully they peer review it and give it a really cool name soon. And Borealopelta definitely is the best discovery of the year. And that's what we were referring to in that clip when we we're talking about the Notosaur, if you didn't recognize it. <laughs> yep. It came up a lot last year. Yeah. But there was another good ankylosaur find, which is our runner-up, Zool. A new ankylosaurine that was described by Victoria Arbor and David Evans in Royal Society Open Science. And thanks to Stuart for sharing this one with us on Facebook. So there's this amazing ankylosaurus, I should say ankylosaur find, that was from the Badlands in northern Montana near Haver. It's a pretty small town in the Badlands, as you'd guess. And it's pretty close up to the Canadian border. So there were some researchers that were excavating a scattered tyrannosaurid, so they were going pretty far away from the bones trying to find any other pieces they could, and they accidentally excavated part of a tail club of an ankylosaur. So they called in people who would be interested in ankylosaurs, and the first name that comes to mind is probably Victoria Arbor. So <laughs> she came in along with David Evans and some other preparators, and they found this massive upside down ankylosaur and they removed it in two huge blocks. So the one that had the skull and the torso of the ankylosaur weighed more than 15 tons. I think it was like 35,000 pounds. Jeez. So super huge. And then there was a smaller block that they took out that had the tail in it. It's just the one? Yes, it's just one. That's crazy when you think about the Utah Raptor project and how it's a nine-ton block and there's multiple Utah <laughs> Raptors. Yeah, and Kylosaurs are much bigger than Utah Raptors. <laughs> and those were so compacted in there, whereas this might be a little bit more spread out. Mm. 
So far, they've prepared the nearly complete skull with the jaws and teeth, and then part of the tail club, basically like the top half of it. But still left to prepare, they have the neck and back vertebrae, the hips, ribs, osteoderms, skin impressions, possible keratinous sheaths that went over the osteoderms, and then maybe more stuff. They don't really know what's all in there because it's all encased in this huge rock right now. And they say that it's going to take several years to complete at the Royal Ontario Museum. So it's up in Canada being prepared now. That'll be exciting. Yeah, it's going to be awesome when it's done. They named it Zool Creavastator, and that's after the monster Zool from Ghostbusters. They thought that the head of Zool looked kind of like an ankylosaur, and so there you go. <laughs> There's your genus name. I know at least one of my coworkers enjoyed that. Yeah. I didn't really grow up watching Ghostbusters. It's pretty funny. Who you going to call? <laughs> yeah. Zool. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Zool's a monster. Yeah. But ankylosaurs are cooler than the Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the species name, Creeravastator, translates roughly to destroyer of shins. <laughs> <laughs> that's accurate. Yeah. That's a pretty awesome name for an ankylosaur. And it has this amazingly well-preserved tail club. It's got preserved skin. It's got these bony spikes going down the sides of the handle. And the handle is those fused vertebrae that go just before the bony club. And then it's got a really great tail club knob, too. So it just looks awesome. And it's got tendons along it. It looks so cool. <laughs> And then the skull is also in really great shape, especially the left side. And like I mentioned in an earlier episode, since dinosaurs are all bilaterally symmetric, if you have half of the skull perfectly preserved, you know exactly what the other half looked like because it's a mirror image. And Well, mostly, right? Like how our face, we're not exactly the same. Oh, I guess so. Yeah, there's individual variation. But in terms <laughs> of like species level, you'll be symmetric. Yeah. So... On the left side of the skull, you can see all the horns on the entire head. And then you can also see the eyelid, which is obviously like armored skin. It just looks so awesome. And there's some really great paleo art done of it. Yeah, I definitely recommend looking it up. It's estimated that the find is about 75 million years old, which puts it in the late Cretaceous. And it was probably about six meters or 20 feet long and weighed about two and a half tons. The other cool thing about it is they did a digital reconstruction of the skull in 3D, which you can look at online. And the area where it was found has also preserved turtles, crocodiliforms, theropods, hadrosaurids, invertebrates, and plants. So we know a lot about what was around when it was around there. And obviously there was also a tyrannosaur because <laughs> that's how they discovered this guy. The authors also say it's, quote, the first ankylosaurin skeleton known with a complete skull and tail club, and it is the most complete ankylosaurid ever found in North America, end quote. Nice. So a really, really awesome find. It's pretty similar to ankylosaurus because it's got that big tail club and it's from the late Cretaceous. It's so cool looking. And I can't wait until they finish excavating that 15 ton block and find out what else is preserved inside there. We also have a second runner up because there were so many good dinosaur discoveries mm -hmm. and papers, which is Patagotitan, which was the giant titanosaur mounted at the Amer American Museum of Natural History, which finally got a name this year. Yep. Recommend visiting that museum if you can. The titanosaur at the American Museum of Natural History and it was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B by Jose L. Carballido and others. So I don't know if the Titanosaur still has its Tumblr account or when they first unveiled it and mm -hmm. you know, talked to the whale, but they'd have to change its name. Yeah, I noticed on their website I checked and they still haven't updated that, so it still just says the Titanosaur. <laughs> that is what it's famous for now. Yeah, and I'm guessing they'll update it soon. So the real name, the official name now, is... Patagotitan Maiorum, and Patagotitan refers to Patagonia as well as Titan for giant or, you know, like all the other titanosaurs that have Titan in the name. When I hear it, I think Patagogo Titan or something like that. <laughs> like uh, Inspector Gadget. Oh, yeah, that could be what I'm thinking of. <laughs> 
And then the Maiorum refers to the Mayo family, quote, for their hospitality during field work at the La Flecha Ranch. So that must have been some really good hospitality to get the species named after them. Yeah. Well, they were probably there a while to excavate. True. Yeah. I think they said it took about a year when we saw the documentary about it. So That's quite the hospitality. Yeah. <laughs> You might have seen a picture of the researchers laying down next to the enormous femur that's actually taller than them, and it's taller than anyone because it's about eight feet long. It's, Unless you're a giant. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone who's been taller than eight feet, is there? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. It's estimated to be 69 tons and 120 feet, or about 37 meters long, and... It might be the biggest ever. It's hard to say because the weight estimate has a plus or minus 17 ton standard error. So it could be the biggest. It could be like the 10th biggest. Yeah, not everybody agrees. And actually, Greg posted on our Facebook a link about this. Sauropod vertebra picture of the week had a post called, Don't Believe the Hype, Patagotitan was not bigger than Argentinosaurus, so... Yeah, they're really just like the same, <laughs> it, uh, any kind of margin of error, because Argentinosaurus has kind of a similar standard error. It even has less bones known, so you can't really say how much these things weighed, and there's always a big overlap in the weight estimates. So picking out which one is the heaviest is like, you know, it could be any of them, basically. And it's funny that you mentioned Argentinosaurus, because that's actually its closest known relative based on the phylogenetic parsimony. So they're both definitely contenders for the largest ever land animal. And then, like Danny Barta said in our interview three weeks ago, they found several individuals that were combined, and when they combined them, they created the American Museum of Natural History specimen, and they have a picture in the paper that shows which bones came from which specimen, which is kind of cool to see, and then which bones are unknown, which of course includes the skull, unfortunately. Also, like Danny Barta mentioned, they weren't finished growing, even though the growth had slowed, so they were probably close to finished growing, but it's unclear exactly how big they ultimately would have gotten. We also have the most surprising new dinosaur <laughs> of the year, which we have as Halskaraptor, because no one was expecting just how crazy this thing is. And thanks to Chris for sharing it with us on Twitter. It's a new dinosaur from Mongolia called Halskaraptor esquiei, I think. The Halskaraptor is from Halska Alsmolska, who we've talked about a couple times before, who was a paleontologist from 1930 to 2008, and they named it after her for her contributions to theropod paleontology. Cool. And then esquiei is from Francois Esquiei. Or something like that. What do you think, Sabrina? Might also be something like Esquilier. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the certainty. <laughs> <laughs> so he returned the poached holotype to Mongolia of this dinosaur. And he's French, as you can probably tell from his name. So it was smuggled originally out of Mongolia and then to Japan and then Britain and France and when Francois got it, he returned it, which is how he got the dinosaur named after him. The dinosaur is essentially a full articulated skeleton with the skull, including teeth, a torso, legs, arm, most of the tail, and it almost looks too perfect. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Lots of news stories about that. Yeah, the researchers were worried that maybe it had been faked, as is often the case with some of these Asian dinosaurs where they get smuggled. and. Because of that, they went through some extra efforts to ensure that it was a real find. So first, they noticed that it wasn't fully prepared, so they actually had to remove some more of the sediment from the fossil in order to get a really good look at it, which indicated that it was probably unlikely to be fake, because typically, if you're trying to get the most money for a fossil, you want to show off just how many bones you've stuck together and faked. <laughs> you wouldn't be likely to cover some of them. And after that, and I think the reason that most of the news coverage was probably about this, was because the title of the paper actually talks about how they used the European synchrotron to validate that it wasn't a composite of different pieces of rock. 
So the researchers took it to the European synchrotron, which is a super massive, powerful X-ray that we've talked a little bit about before. It's basically a huge loop that accelerates the X-rays. And then there are all these little labs that kind of stick off from the side of it and they split off a little bit of the beam. But it's a really powerful beam, even if you split it into 100 little pieces. And you can use it to scan through rock that you wouldn't be able to with a normal CT scanner. And part of that, I think, is also because normal CT scanners are used on human bodies. And on living tissue, you can't bombard it with really powerful X-ray radiation because you'll damage it. But if you're dealing with fossils, you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. And it's kind of <laughs> like the more powerful, the better, the deeper you can see. So... It's a pretty ideal case for looking at something like this where you're trying to see below the surface where there might be kind of a fake layer hiding something beneath the surface. And after they spent 46 hours doing 148 scans oh, wow. and various CT slices, they decided that it wasn't fake and that it was really a, a genuine specimen. And they can also tell based on the sedimentology of the specimen that it looks to be from Uka Tolgad which is a late Cretaceous, about 70 million years ago, formation in Mongolia that includes the flightless bird Mononychus, which is an alvarosaurid, the ones with little tiny arms. Hmm. <laughs> and this guy isn't an alvarosaurid, though. It's a very unusual dinosaur because it lived in both land and water based on some of its features. It has feet like a dromaeosaur, meaning it has those raptor claws. Yeah. But it has a very swan-like neck, and the reason that they think that it lived in the water doesn't have anything to do with the neck, because we see that in other dinosaurs sometimes. It's because the ratio of its finger lengths is similar to some aquatic reptiles, basically meaning that its fingers look sort of flipper-shaped. <laughs> Which isn't immediately obvious by looking at it, because it doesn't have really long fingers or anything like that. Like, it doesn't look like it has wings or big flippers. It just looks flipper-shaped. And there are a lot of birds that sort of have that kind of look to them, that just spend a little bit of time underwater, so they don't necessarily need really big flippers. And this is where I really got into the weeds on this one, because <laughs> I had to go to multiple rabbit hole deep of their references, like references of references, oh, to learn about some of these bird characteristics. So... What the researchers did is they did principal component analysis, which is a statistical tool to combine features of your specimens and kind of correlate a matrix of them. So you can piece together, oh, this group looks like they all have these two components together. And in this case, the principal components that came out were size, which they ended up throwing out because that's not a very good indicator. You can find animals in different ecosystems of varying sizes mm -hmm. and doesn't correlate that well. The second one they found was a combination of the flattening and shortening of forelimb bones. So that's what I mean by a principal component. It's like both of those factors combined mm. in a certain ratio. And then principal component three was the sternum expansion, which is the bone in the middle of your chest. And they think that that probably expanded to increase attachment points for pectoral muscles. Huh. You could imagine how that could be useful if you had flippers. <laughs> to get to that point... What they did was they looked at 245 birds <laughs> from <laughs> six different types of locomotion. They had non-swimmers, which included things like the ostrich and the skua. And the skua is the bird we talked about with Matt Lamana. That's that crazy, it lives near the water, mm -hmm. but it doesn't actually swim at all. It's just like dive bombs thing. And he was describing it as like kind of like a hawk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something you wouldn't want to be around. Exactly, yeah. But they have no real interaction with the water they just, other than the fact that they live near it. Then there are foot-propelled underwater swimmers, and those include things like loons and Hesperornis. And Hesperornis is that crazy prehistoric bird that looks like a penguin with huge feet. <laughs> so it's like pushing itself around with these huge feet. Then you have things that are wing-propelled underwater swimmers, like the emperor penguin. They've got big flippers instead mm -hmm. of wings, essentially, at that point. So wing is maybe not necessarily the best case for emperor penguins, but there are some other birds that actually use wings for underwater swimming rather than flippers. Mm -hmm. There are surface swimmers, like swans and mallards. You know, you yep. can imagine what that's like. 
just paddling around. Plungers like the brown pelican, and we saw those dive bombing in the Caribbean one time. They kind of like just dive down a tiny bit. Yeah. And grab a fish and then pop back up. <laughs> really close to people too. Yeah. Yeah. Pelicans don't care. <laughs> <laughs> And then there are the foot and wing propelled underwater swimmers, which includes some ducks and some seabirds. And I couldn't find any that I had heard of before, but there was one called the golden eye duck, which I thought was kind of cool. Sounds like a James Bond kind of duck. It does, except it really just has a tiny bit of gold around its eye. It's not that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, obviously there's a very complicated group of birds to piece through. But when they did the principal component analysis and you have that graph of flattened and shortened forelimbs versus sternum expansion, they all kind of end up in their own areas of the graphs. So over in one corner, you have the non-swimmers and a different area of the surface swimmers and et cetera. What they found with Halska raptor is that it fits in the area with the wing-propelled birds, like the emperor penguin, which kind of fits too with how, you know, they think its fingers look a little bit flipper-shaped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it still has raptor feet. Yeah, which is, I guess, also makes sense. It probably couldn't really use its feet for locomotion underwater if it had big claws mm -hmm. on it, you know. I think it's pretty interesting how the how Halska raptor is portrayed, too, because it's basically like a swan with teeth, claws, a tail, <laughs> and shorter wings. That's what it pretty much looks like. Pretty scary looking. Yeah. <laughs> And when they recreated it with its lifelike posture, they think that it was about 45 centimeters or a foot and a half tall and about 50 centimeters or one foot eight inches long, which is a little bit smaller than modern swans, but it's still pretty big for a bird. And modern swans are some of the biggest birds, so it's not too surprising that it's a little smaller. And this specimen, they think, was also a sub-adult, so maybe it had a little more growing to do. It's kind of hard to say. Interestingly, it's a pretty close relative to Austroraptor, and it's now housed at the Institute of Paleontology and Geology at the Mongolian Academy of Sciences in Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. Cool. Which I think is pretty much where most of their dinosaurs are. So... It's a place to go if you're in Mongolia and you want to see some dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> or just if you're in Mongolia. That's true. Yeah, that's <laughs> the place we would go. <laughs> Halskaraptor is definitely an oddball. Yes, since it was semi-aquatic. Yeah. <laughs> Swan-like. Swan monster. Swans are already monsters. I guess. <laughs> that's pretty, pretty true. <laughs> And then we have a category that we had to do because we got so many good listener questions. We have the best listener question, which came from Brendan on Facebook. And there's also a follow-up, so it's going to be kind of a jump in the middle of this one. Next up, we got a message from Brendan via Facebook. He said, hey guys, I have a random question for you. Do you know if any dinos hopped like kangaroos? Just saw a video of a small bird on a moving walkway at an airport, and watching it hop made me wonder if any theropods moved the same way. With a tail to offset the basic build of many theropods seems potentially conducive to this. Perhaps muscle attachments and bone shape could be a way to see if any did this? Enjoy the rabbit hole, Garrett. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> it did send me down a rabbit hole. Because these types of questions are not something you can just look up in a book. And I did try. I looked in the index of all the dinosaur books I have for hopping behavior, but there wasn't anything. Maybe we should compile these someday. <laughs> Cr crazy rabbit holes about dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So to answer the question, I started with a different question. Why do birds hop? To look for any kind of similarities to dinosaurs. And I found a really helpful essay from Stanford where they point out that birds on branches often hop when it's too narrow to walk. And then when on land, birds with shorter legs seem to hop a lot more often. And they said, quote, the evidence seems to point to economy of effort. Short-legged birds move farther in a single hop than they do taking several steps, whereas it is more economical for larger birds with longer strides to move one leg at a time. So that kind of makes sense. You know, if you have really short legs, but you're good at hopping, 
and walking is going to be a pain. <laughs> Might as well just hop around. I was just thinking the difference between how I walk and how you walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was thinking about little dogs too, because aren't there some dogs that only use like three of their legs when they're running quickly or something? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah. It kind of makes sense. But they did say that even with that characteristic, quote, a hopper in a hurry tends to break into a run. <laughs> so that made me think of those snowy plovers and some of those birds you see running down the beach mm -hmm. with their little legs moving so fast you can barely see them. But that obviously takes a lot more energy than little hops, I guess. So given that non-avian dinosaurs tended to be pretty leggy, I wouldn't really expect them to hop much based on that information. You know, they tend to have pretty long legs. I was looking for an example of a short-legged bipedal dinosaur and one of the examples people give is spinosaurus and even spinosaurus had pretty long legs especially compared to some of these birds so yeah and i wouldn't really imagine spinosaurus hopping around probably not sure but then the other way to look at it is by looking at trackways so to date there isn't any trackway of a hopping dinosaur they basically all have alternating prints just like you'd expect from an animal walking or running there is one possible exception where alternating prints seem to be followed at the end by a hop, but that's not really what we'd expect from a kangaroo-like hopper. You know, it looks more like it was going to hop onto something or hop over something. But that's not to say that this couldn't happen. It's really impossible to prove that something never existed, and there are lots of dinosaurs that haven't been discovered yet, and like we've said before, there's lots of dinosaurs that we will never discover just because of the habitat they lived in. And it's hard to tell exactly how dinosaurs were using muscles based on just the attachment points in their legs. Because like we were saying, there are birds that hop pretty frequently, but then can also run. So they obviously have musculature that can do both. And then really the only way we'd be able to tell for sure is if we found a trackway that showed pretty much hopping kangaroo-like dinosaur prints. That would be the way to know for sure. So I kind of hope we do find that. That would be really cool if we found like some compsognathus sized little theropod with hop marks along a beach somewhere. That would be pretty neat. It's possible. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely possible. Since they lived so long. Yeah, it's a really so long many. time and really diverse groups. I just recently found the first burrowing one within the last few years. So why not a hopper? Yep. And we, you know, found out that Originally, we thought a lot of them were aquatic, and then we didn't think any of them were, and then we found some aquatic or semi-aquatic ones again. So their behavior is really up for debate as soon as you find just another fossil. It can really open things up. We have a couple follow-ups from our discussion about hopping dinosaurs that we had last week. And Brendan sent us a message on Facebook and pointed out that Sclermoclus... I think is how you say it, is sometimes depicted as hopping. And weirdly, Sclermoclus might actually be a basal pterosaur, meaning just a very early pterosaur before they could fly, I guess. If it did hop, I think it should get the nickname like a demon bunny or something because <laughs> <laughs> it's really small and it was probably a predator and it definitely had teeth and stuff. So it would have been kind of intense and weird hopping around. Lythronax Argestes shared a link on Reddit of an Edmontosaurus from a 2009 paper in Paleontological Electronica, and it also shows a hopping dinosaur. <laughs> but in this case, it's an Edmontosaurus that's doing three different gates, and the authors derived it from computer modeling, like I said back in 2009, and they had three different possibilities, and I'm going to list them in increasing speed. So the slowest one that they simulated was bipedal running, like a T-Rex in Jurassic Park, for instance. And it was going about 31 miles an hour, 50 kilometers an hour, which is pretty fast. They also did quadrupedal galloping, and that bumped it up 5 miles an hour up to 36 or 58 kilometers an hour. But then hopping was actually the fastest at 38 miles an hour or 61 kilometers an hour. So pretty weird <laughs> that an Amontosaurus, which is a huge, huge hadrosaur, would be depicted as hopping. And the tracks that we've seen from Edmontosaurus don't match hopping. 
and the model didn't account for the stresses that hopping would impart on the body because you could imagine if you're hopping it's going to put a lot of stress on the joints that are taking that big impact as you're bounding along. The authors of this simulation think that hopping was actually the least likely of the three, so maybe it did some combination of bipedal running and quadrupedal galloping, depending on what kind of speed and efficiency it was looking to do. So we still don't really know if any dinosaurs hopped, but one might have if it wasn't a pterosaur, <laughs> and a Montosaurus maybe could have if it could handle all the stresses, or maybe something that has a similar kind of body plan to an Edmontosaurus, but is smaller, might be a good candidate for hopping. It's interesting how hopping would be the fastest way. Yeah, yeah, that's really weird to me. I think it's because it's basically like, you know, jumping, so you can clear a lot of space on just a single bound as long as your muscles are set up for that kind of thing. Like kangaroos, they go so far in a single stride that you could see how it could be more efficient, at least speed-wise. <laughs> I don't know about energy-wise. Next up, we've got the most controversial paper, which is unquestionably the Ornithocelida or Ornithoscelida paper, which proposes reclassifying dinosaurs in a pretty major way. This new hypothesis about dinosaur phylogeny that's been blowing up the internet, not really the whole internet. Just well, the any, anywhere talking section. about dinosaurs, yeah. Yeah. And people were tweeting that, you know, tweet like twice a year, just like crazy because there was so much stuff going on. And so as a quick background just because it's always good to remind ourselves. Traditionally, we've got two dinosaur groups based on kind of their hip layouts. And you've got Saurischia, which are the sauropodomorphs, things like Brontosaurus, and then also all the theropods, which are all the predators, and then a couple weirdos like Therizinosaurs that ate plants. But mostly it's the huge herbivores, and then all the carnivores in Saurischia. And then you have the Ornithischians, and those are all the herbivores that aren't sauropods, basically. So you've got Stegosaurs, Ceratopsians, Hadrosaurs, Ankylosaurs, Pachycephalosaurs, you know, the list goes on and on. There's a ton of Ornithischians. Yeah, so the Saurischians come from the Latin for lizard-hipped because their hips are arranged similar to some modern lizards, and Ornithischians means bird-hipped because their hips are arranged similarly to some modern birds. So that's been the structure for about 130 years. Back in 1877, that was originally discussed, and that's where we're at now. The new hypothesis goes a completely different way than just those two broad categories, because right now every single dinosaur would fit either in Saurischia and Ornithischia. In this new method, I guess, or hypothesis, they revived a clade by T.H. Huxley yeah. named... Good old Huxley. <laughs> yeah. And he had one called Ornithoscelida, and it used to include several different things when Huxley named it, but they just kind of reused the name, not really the exact same way he used it. But in their version, you've got Ornithischians and Theropods. So previously, Ornithischians were their own thing, and then theropods were lumped in with sauropodomorphs in Saurischians. So we kind of took the theropods out of Saurischia. Yeah, get them out. And stuck them in. Keep it to the sauropods. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then you have the redefined Saurischians as sauropodomorphs, and then there are a few Triassic carnivores like Herrerasaurids in there. So it's not just sauropodomorphs by themselves as Sabrina would probably like it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of, that's a bummer. Some of the cladistics kind of put the sauropodomorphs on their own branch when they were simplifying the story for the news, but there are some carnivores in there, so it's not quite that simple. Hmm. I don't know if I can get on board with this. Then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the authors got this model from computer modeling, and that's usually how we do these paleontology family trees because you know it's it's really hard for a person to look at differences in bones and figure out how many characteristics they have in common and do the statistics on which ones have more in common than others especially they were looking at over 400 different characteristics so you can plop all these different species in there with all these characteristics and it'll give you a likely family tree so it came up with these two basic main groups 
and it also pushed the first likely true dinosaur evolution date back to 247 million years ago, which is at least 4 million years older than any previous estimate had been. So it's a very different look at how dinosaurs evolved, and it also has some other weird features. For instance, there's now carnivores and herbivores in both groups, and because of that the authors are postulating that maybe the earliest dinosaurs might have been omnivores instead of carnivores. Hmm. And pretty much everyone up till this point has said the earliest dinosaurs were carnivores, then some became omnivores, and then finally some of them became herbivores later. I guess that would make sense, right? They were too small to be the dominant ones. Not so really. You just eat whatever. No, because, yeah. I mean, you just eat bugs or you eat little fish or something. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, they weren't necessarily eating each other. In a pinch, though, if you're hungry. Yeah, that's kind of what they were saying. They could be like generalists that way. So kind of like a bear or something. <laughs> you know, if there aren't animals around, you just eat something else. You just mm. eat whatever. But one advantage to this model is that it simplifies feather evolution because as it stands with the Saurischians and the Ornithischians, there are feathers in both groups. And that means there has to be some really old common ancestor basically before dinosaurs that had feathers or at least some feather-like structure, most likely. They could have evolved separately, but it seems unlikely since no other animals have evolved feathers. And in this group, all of the feathers are within that new Ornithoscelida. So that kind of simplifies feather evolution. But one of the biggest problems with it is we don't have really well-preserved Triassic Ornithischians, so it makes this modeling really difficult and probably the biggest problem is we have 130 years of science that kind of is based on Ornithischians and Saurischians. So as Carl Sagan said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. If you're trying to overturn such a huge volume of scientific literature, you really need some really powerful evidence. And some paleontologists are saying they're not quite there yet. We need some more studies, we need some more independent verification of this kind of work before we throw away all of our own, all of our old textbooks. Sure. But uh, I think it's interesting, though, just going back to Huxley. What if just everything Huxley said turned out to be right? <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he definitely was wrong, though. I mean, he had other groups in there that didn't make sense and things like that. Yeah. But yeah, it is always funny when things go back to Huxley. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. There were some really funny tweets about it. One of my favorites was the Planet of the Apes and where the Statue of Liberty was like buried in the sand and said you blew it up. There was a picture of the old cladogram with the Saurischians and the Ornithischians. <laughs> and there's another picture of somebody that had put all their dinosaur textbooks in the garbage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. It doesn't change a ton for the stuff that we talk about because we usually just talk about like within theropods, you have this going on and theropods are still theropods. You know, stegosaurs are still stegosaurs. It's just how these groups are related and how they might have evolved, which does have some effect on how we think their behavior and things might have been. But mostly it doesn't change too much about the specific dinosaurs. Not surprisingly, since the publication, the paper has been challenged and we're kind of at a point now where we need more fossils, just like we, we always, always do. do. Yeah. <laughs> We also have another very controversial paper, and this one's about T-Rex and scales, <laughs> <laughs> as well as a new dinosaur that kind of sneaks in. So there's a new dinosaur from the Two Medicine Formation, and we briefly talked about it with Dave Trexler and Corey Coverdell from the Two Medicine Dinosaur Center last summer when we were visiting and we did our dig. And back then it was just known as Displetosaurus something, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unknown species. And Displetosaurus is in the Tyrannosauridae family, but it is not a Tyrannosaurus. So there have been a lot of news articles about this, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But anyway, it's named after Jack Horner, Displetosaurus horneri. And it lived in the late Cretaceous about 75 million years ago. And it was about 9 meters or 30 feet long and about 2.2 meters or 7.2 feet tall, which puts it roughly three quarters the size of a T-Rex, maybe a little bit smaller. 
but still a pretty sizable carnivore. Yep, something you would not want to get in the way of. <laughs> yeah. They found a partial arm, a nearly complete leg, and a complete skull. And about the skull, they said, quote, the texture of the facial bones of the new taxon and other derived tyrannosauroids indicates a scaly integument with high tactile sensitivity, end quote. And basically what the authors are saying there is that they're assuming that the small holes around the mouth are for nerves and blood vessels to make them more sensitive. So we talked a little bit about that with Spinosaurus and how they might have been able to detect water vibrations and use that, you know, kind of put their snout underwater and feel when a fish is coming and then chop it without necessarily having to see it first. And it's based on the assumption that they have this in common with modern crocodilians that have kind of a similar potential scale pattern and similar nerves around their mouths. And the thing that got everybody stirred up in the media, it seems like, is something they put near the end of the paper where they said, quote, as in crocodilians, female tyrannosaurids would have relied upon ISOs, which is what they're calling those nerves that kind of help them feel extra sensitivity around their mouth. And would have aided adult tyrannosaurids in harmlessly picking up eggs and nestlings, and in courtship, tyrannosaurids might have rubbed their sensitive faces together as a vital part of pre-copulatory play, end quote. Meh. And that last piece is the thing that most people latched onto. Even though it just says might have. <laughs> yes, it's very speculative. And... So there are lots of clickbaity headlines like Tyrannosaurus Rex was a sensitive lover, new dinosaur discovery <laughs> suggests, or, <laughs> but like I said, it's not even about Tyrannosaurus Rex. And then also scientists discover new species of crocodile-like dinosaur, sort of, I guess. It's not really crocodile-like any more than any other dinosaur, but yeah. So it's an interesting interpretation of the holes around the t-rex's face and there's a couple other details about smooth versus rough patches and most of that boils down to whether or not there were scales there so interestingly it's probably a solid point scored by the crocodile lipped argument you know rather than we talked about some of the other options like big jowly lips or you know the tight lizard lips this is more like the crocodile where the teeth are poking out around it. And they say that because it appears that there's evidence for scales getting too close to the opening of the mouth so there wouldn't have been room for lips. At least that's their hypothesis. I also like the Tinder-inspired Washington Post dinosaur dating profiles. <laughs> they had a picture of a T-Rex and they said, quote, likes snout rubbing and raw Edmontosaurus steak dinners, mm. dislikes Triceratops and asteroids. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty clever. And I just want to reiterate, because I think it's an important point, this really doesn't say anything definitively about T-Rex, because as the authors point out, Displetosaurus taurusus likely evolved directly into Displetosaurus horneri. They're very similar, and they seem to be sequential in time. But T-Rex likely arrived from an Asian lineage later. And we do generally infer a lot between groups. So since they're both in Tyrannosauridae, and fossils are really rare, you tend to make a lot of inferences, like how we say T-Rex probably had feathers, even though we've never found feathers near a T-Rex. We have seen Euteranus with feathers all over them, and they're close enough related that we figure, okay, there are probably some feathers on T-Rex. So the same kind of logic is applying to say that T-Rex might have had these similar scaly lips that were extra sensitive and things like that. But it is really hypothetical. Even the idea that this specific Displetosaurus had this extra sensitivity in the lips is a little bit speculative, but it's really interesting. It's cool to see when they can draw out these other inferences from fossils, like what kind of lips the dinosaur might have had. I really like that. So that's interesting then. That, does that mean we know for sure they had lips? Because well, that was speculative before, right? Yeah. I mean, we know, I guess by like a by one definition, you'd say everything kind of has lips because that's just like the closest thing to the teeth. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then the question is, you know, how big the lips are, what they're made out of, if they're scales, if they're, you know, jowly or whatever. Yeah, this is one more piece of evidence towards them not having big lips and having more like simple like crocodile lips. Cool. There's still a lot of room for extra information here. <laughs> there always is. Yeah.
We also have the best random thought. The sauropod vertebra picture of the week wrote this interesting post about a neglected theme in paleo art, which is sauropods stomping turtles. <laughs> so speaking of, you know, you have these dinosaur exhibits, but there was other fauna around. So the idea, <laughs> there's cases of modern herbivores eating meat, cows oh, yeah. and deer, for example. Yeah, like cows, if, they, if they're grazing and they just like stumble upon some small animal, sometimes they'll just eat it. Mm -hmm. It's super creepy and weird. So the idea is that sauropods were growing really quickly, and maybe sometimes they ate turtles for some quick protein and <laughs> calcium. <laughs> so what, in theory, could have happened is they could have stomped on the turtle, so then they'd, the turtle would be in bite-sized chunks. Oh, jeez. Maybe they stepped on them accidentally, and that's how it started. But <laughs> <laughs> turtles and sauropods did often coexist, so it's a very interesting idea. Yeah, that makes sauropods seem a lot less friendly. <laughs> It does. <laughs> I mean, if you got big enough, you probably wouldn't even notice the turtle beneath yeah. you. Or it'd be like stepping on gum and you'd be like, ew, yeah. what was that? Oh, it's a turtle. Oh, maybe I'll eat that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good speculation. Sauropods had to grow fast somehow. <laughs> that's true. Up next, speaking of things dinosaurs ate, is our best dinosaur food study. <laughs> which is obviously a very specific category. The title of it is The Biomechanics Behind Extreme Osteophagy in Tyrannosaurus Rex. And if you're not familiar with the word osteophagy, it just means eating bones. Oh, <laughs> yeah. what a paper. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So basically, they start out by saying that most carnivorous mammals regularly break bones open with their teeth and get at the marrow that's you know, inside the bones, which is actually pretty nutritious. It's good to be able to get to it. But that's kind of unusual in the carnivore category. So most carnivorous animals can't break open bones. <laughs> and the way you get the ability to break open bones is you need a really high bite force, but you also need the right tooth pattern and basically tooth structure in order to create enough sheer stresses on the bone to break it. Because bone is really hard to break, you know, and kind of by design, mm -hmm. but it can break relatively easy, meaning easier than other methods of breaking it by shear stresses, which are like scissors. So if you imagine kind of like when you're breaking a stick, if you like ah. bend it across your knee, that kind of stress. Except the stick is your leg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So in that analogy, like one of the teeth is your leg and your hands are your teeth. And then, anyway, so most modern reptiles don't have the ability to break open bones and get at marrow. That's nice. So they have to swallow the bones whole and then they have their acidic stomach acid just kind of dissolve the whole thing or they have to spit it back out. Oh, I wonder what, what prey feels more. <laughs> I think the prey is long dead by the time this issue is coming about, okay. generally speaking. Mm. But <laughs> yeah, so they sometimes spit them back out or sometimes they just, you know, digest them and there's just little pieces of bone that make it all the way through or whatever. But in any event, crocodiles occasionally can break bones, but they don't really do it intentionally. They just kind of swallow things whole. And then every once in a while, since their bite force is so strong, they kind of incidentally break some bones. <laughs> And then some vultures also break bones, but what they do is they drop them from a really high height, and then that cracks them open, and then they it's eat like out of the marrow. It's like what crows do to crack open nuts. <laughs> yep, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> so, yeah, birds are pretty clever, but most animals don't have this ability. So then the question is, how about T-Rex? Previous bite force estimates range from a conservative 13,400 newtons, or about 3,000 pounds, which is enough to bite through a cow pelvis. Ooh. And they, you know, it could definitely do that because there are indications that they've bitten through, say, like a triceratops frill, which is a pretty thick piece of bone, not too dissimilar. Sure. Plus, that's what they ate in Jurassic Park. So, yeah. <laughs> I think that was actually the raptors that ate that. I think the T-Rex ate a goat. Oh, uh, okay. But yeah, I get your point. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the upper end... There have been estimates as high as 301,000 newtons or 67,667 pounds, which is, you know, what is that, 20 times as much, 22 <laughs> times as much? <laughs> and they got to that estimate from scaling up an American alligator to T-Rex size and then doubling that number because it had some extra muscles. 
Because if you think about a crocodile head, it doesn't have that same robustness that a T-Rex head has with possibly more muscle attachment points. So then the question is, why don't you look at the actual biomechanics of a T-Rex head rather than strange things like biting through a cow pelvis or <laughs> how would a giant alligator That's be? That's fun. <laughs> I guess. So previously, researchers have estimated based on biomechanics stresses that T-Rex could have bitten between 35,000 and 57,000 newtons or 7,800 to 12,800 pounds. And that seems a little bit more reasonable. But there were a couple of issues that Gignac and Erickson had with this paper, and they wanted to do kind of an updated take on it. So they started by gathering data from huge living crocodiles. And in an interview with NPR, they talked about how they had to like lasso this 14 or 17 foot long alligator oh and then like put a scale in its mouth so that they could measure its bite force. And I'm sure that like alligator that. loved it. Yeah. <laughs> And that makes sense because crocodiles and alligators are dinosaurs' closest relatives that have teeth. Well, it, it makes sense that, yeah, that's what you want to measure. I don't know if it makes sense that you'd want to lasso an alligator and sure. stick a scale in its, it's mouth. It's for science. <laughs> <laughs> in the name of science, everything is important. <laughs> so, they, like I said, they made a couple different assumptions in the previous biomechanical model. They digitally modeled the jaw muscles, but they changed them a little bit. And then they looked at the shear forces on the teeth and the ability to break bones, because that's really the name of the game in this paper. Ultimately, they looked at lots of different T-Rex skulls because they're all different sizes and have different teeth geometries, and that affects how they could break bones. But the largest bite force came out of Sue the T-Rex, probably not too surprising since it's so big. And they got a bite force range of 17,700 to 34,500 newtons, which works out to 4,050 to 7,761 pounds. Seems like quite a range. It is, but it, it depends on the location in the jaw. So if you bite near your molars versus if you bite near the front of your mouth, you can get a lot more pressure near the back of your mouth where you don't have the torque working against you and you're closer to the muscle attachments. So that's really what the factors were here. And then Erickson on NPR said, quote, that's like setting three small cars on top of the jaws of a T-Rex. That's basically what was pushing down, end quote. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I never really thought about it like that, but that's a really good way to think about it with those big, sharp teeth. And then you rest that skull on top of yourself and then put a couple cars on top of it. That's a pretty awful situation to be in. <laughs> I'm glad they're extinct. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> so in case you're wondering, you need about 65 megapascals or 9,400 PSI to break bone with one bite. Or you can repeat many times, like some smaller mammals will just kind of chew repetitively and you can break it down slowly. Sue could reach 2,974 megapascals or 431,342 PSI on its best teeth in terms of creating this pressure. And most of the teeth in its mouth easily exceeded the 65 megapascals across most of the length of the tooth. It's not even just like the tip of the tooth had enough force. It was almost like half of the tooth, just like going halfway down, could just like obliterate bone. Hmm. So you can see how T-Rex became known for this bone crushing ability. <laughs> and another cool thing is that if you look at Sue or most T-Rex, you'll see that the teeth aren't really uniform along the jaw. And what that ends up doing is it causes these sort of pressure points, like I was talking about holding a stick and pressing with your knee. You can actually get that both across the jaw. So then the, the lower jaw, which fits inside the upper jaw, it's like two points of contact on the bottom of the bone and then two points on the top of the bone, but outside. Hmm. So like the upper jaw is the top contact point. So it works like those pairs of teeth are bending a bone in half. So you can break, you know, the way that you'd see like a dog chew on a bone, most likely. <laughs> but their teeth are also so strong and they have the right pattern that just along, say, the right side of its mouth, it could break a bone if it was sticking in that direction. Or say, you know, it's got the frill of a triceratops just on the right side of its mouth. It could crunch right through it. The ultimate predator. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. There are a couple other quotes that I want to share from the article because I think they're really good. One of them is that 
There was so much pressure caused by these jaws, more than we've ever seen in any living animal, that it may have caused, quote, catastrophic explosion of some bones, end quote, which just sounds crazy. That <laughs> yep. <laughs> so much force to just obliterate bones. And they say, quote, the collective results of this taxon's biomechanical and physiological feeding capacities allowed these large-bodied theropods to uniquely exploit large bones from dinosaur carcasses known to include giant horned dinosaurs like Triceratops, duck-billed hadrosaurids like Edmontosaurus, and even other T-Rex hmm. that could not be consumed otherwise by contemporary carnivores. Tyrannosaurus rex, therefore, was able to derive sustenance from bones of prey and scavenged carcasses, much like extant gray wolves and spotted hyenas, end quote. Huh. I think that's a really well-written uh, way to describe how T-Rex may have been a facultative scavenger, basically meaning that it was a hunter, but then if it ever came across, say, some old bones that nothing else was able to break into pieces and get at the marrow, it could just go for it because why not? <laughs> and it probably had that opportunity a fair amount of the time since nothing else was really going for it. So with this idea of this catastrophic explosion of some bones, do you think it was ever really digging into some carcass, there was an explosion of bones, and then like a bone shard hits its eye or something like that? Probably not, but maybe. That would hurt. Yeah, I think it'd be more likely to like cut up its gums if it mm. like kind of exploded in the wrong moment. But, I mean, it would probably just eat all those shards anyway, because in the copper lights of T-Rex, we find all these little tiny pieces of bone all the time. So it seems like they just broke up the bones into little tiny pieces and then ate them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it hurt on its way out? It probably hurt a lot of the way. <laughs> I mean, that's not, that's they not, weren't meant to be digested. Yeah, not really. But if you break them up small enough, it might be okay. And as a runner-up, we have another good dinosaur food study for any hadrosaur fans out there. And this one also has a follow-up, so it'll be a little bit of a jump. The next article has a pretty self-explanatory title, so I'm going to read it. It's called Consumption of Crustaceans by Mega Herbivorous Dinosaurs, Dietary Flexibility and Dinosaur Life History Strategies, which is a really cool title. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to Chris for sharing it with us on Twitter. It was published in Nature's Scientific Reports and researched by Karen Chin and others. And really what they're talking about with that title is that some hadrosaurs ate crustaceans. And they found evidence for this in the Kaiparowitz Formation in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in Utah, in the U.S. And that formation is about 75 million years old, which is the late Cretaceous. And what they found was quote-unquote multi-liter coprolites, in other words, huge <laughs> pieces of dinosaur poo that's been fossilized, <laughs> and they found shell in 10 coprolite samples across three time periods in a 13-mile area. So it seemed to be a pretty consistent pattern, at least in the area. And because of this, Chin thinks that it was intentional that these hadrosaurs were eating crustaceans. And they also said that the crustaceans were up to 60% of the width of the hadrosaur beak, which would make it kind of weird to do accidentally, because if you think about something that big compared to your mouth, you definitely notice if you accidentally were chewing on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also interesting because it appears that the hadrosaurs were eating them in rotten wood, and they were likely eating the wood in order to get at these crustaceans. So it wasn't like hadrosaurs are just eating rotten and wood all the time. But if you want to get at these crustaceans, I guess they were in the rotten wood, which was they knew it was rotten because it had already been a little bit decomposed by fungus. So they were also eating some fungus along with wood and crustaceans. It really seems like a terrible thing to chew on and eat. But I guess if you need some calcium... And that's exactly why they think they were eating them, because crustaceans are really high in calcium in their shells, and birds, modern birds that is, increase their calcium intake during the mating season so that they have that extra mineral in their diet for making eggs. So they think that might be the case with these hadrosaurs too, that they would kind of go en masse to this area to eat a bunch of rotting wood with crustaceans in it in order to get the calcium to make some eggs. Yum. Yep. 
The authors also pointed out how, like, usually dinosaurs get simplified into this carnivore and herbivore categories, and it's really not that simple. We see modern animals that we generally think of as herbivores occasionally eating animals, other animals, <laughs> in order to supplement their diet, or just because it's an easy meal. So seems like hadrosaurs weren't just herbivorous. How'd they know they were hadrosaurs? So the reasons that they listed for why it was probably a hadrosaur is that the most common fossils from the area are hadrosaurs, specifically Parasaurolophus and Griposaurus, but then they also found an ankylosaurid, a nodosaurid, a pachycephalosaurid, a hypsilophodontid, and three ceratopsians from the area, which could all be contenders for giving an herbivorous coprolite or fossilized poop. So first of all, they looked at the size of the coprolite, and that basically reduced it down into ceratopsians and hadrosaurs. But then they had found similar coprolites at two medicine formation that appeared to be from a hadrosaur, myasaura. And then finally, they said, quote, the crushing and shearing abilities of the dentition of hadrosaurs would have allowed them to effectively exploit a broader range of foods than the shearing teeth and jaws of ceratopsians, end quote. So it sounds like they're looking specifically at what the food looked like after it was all chewed up, and it, mo <laughs> <laughs> and it looked more like hadrosaur chewing than ceratopsian chewing. So that's how they ended up at that result. But I could see how that could be hard to know, considering we've never actually witnessed a ceratopsian or a hadrosaur chewing. So that might be why in the title they stuck with mega herbivorous rather than specifically saying hadrosaur. Makes sense. Yep. Our next category, flipping the script, is the most unlikely dinosaur predator when dinosaurs become the food. Hmm. <laughs> about bite force in the horned frog. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, this one. Yeah, and the reason we're talking about it is they extrapolate it to extinct giant frogs. And you may have seen clickbaity titles that say ancient giant frog ate dinosaurs, which is basically sort of what they said. So for a quick background on frogs, because I don't know much about frogs, and I assume if you're listening to a dinosaur podcast, you may not also. The authors wrote, quote, of the nearly 6,800 extant frog species, I didn't realize there were so many frog species. Me either. <laughs> most have weak jaws that play only a minor role in prey capture. South American horned frogs are a notable exception. Aggressive and able to consume vertebrates their own size, these quote-unquote hopping heads use a vice-like grip of their jaws. To it sounds so friendly, hopping heads, but then vice-like grip. Yeah. <laughs> they use the vice-like grip of their jaws to restrain and immobilize prey, end quote. And what they did was they studied that horned frog. It's technically called a serratifris, I think is how you say it. And they estimated the bite force of a Beelzebufo, Yes. Which is an extinct giant frog based on that living horned frog. And I just have to talk a little bit about Beelzebufo just because it's pretty interesting. So the name is based on Beelzebub, which is probably obvious, which was a Philistine god and also an Abrahamian demon. We've talked about that with other dinosaur names too mm -hmm. where something was like worshipped and then a later religion turned it into a demon it's kind of an interesting move but anyway it literally translates to lord of the flies <laughs> which is a perfect name for a giant frog yep i'd love it and if you've played the game ark that's the giant frog that you ride on is one of these things but in real life it was 41 centimeters or 16 inches long and weighed about four and a half kilograms or 10 pounds that's still a large frog yeah but you're not gonna ride it well i mean what's you... your thumbelina <laughs> okay <laughs> in the game you can ride it as a full-sized human <laughs> <laughs> so beelzebufo had sharp teeth that curved towards the back of its mouth only in the top jaw and that's seen in those 
modern South American horned frogs as well. I didn't know any frogs had teeth. That's pretty intense. And then obviously they're good at keeping prey in the mouth, being curved back and sharp and all that. So what they ended up doing was they looked at some modern frogs and tested their bite force. And then they came up with a model for how strong the frogs bite based on the size of their skull. Pretty simple, and it seemed to be a pretty good relationship. So based on the 15 centimeter or 6 inch skull width of Beelzebufo, they estimate that it could have achieved bite forces of 500 to 2200 newtons, or 110 to 500 pounds of force, which is, quote, comparable to medium to large sized mammalian carnivores, end quote. It is a really strong bite force. I think we talked about earlier how humans have a bite force of about 200 pounds on our molars, and this on the upper range goes quite a bit above that for something that only weighs about 10 pounds. So I think the hopping head analogy is pretty good. This guy lived in the latest Cretaceous in Madagascar, and since modern relatives can eat a full-grown rat and small reptiles, it is reasonable to think that Beelzebufo could have eaten small dinosaurs, most likely juvenile dinosaurs that were, you know, just hatching, or maybe it could break open an egg or something. But it's not like this is some big predator that's going out and hunting down raptors. Monster frog. Yeah. It's, so don't think of it as an apex predator that's going after dinosaurs. It's eating dinosaurs the same way like a rat can eat a chicken because it sneaks into a chicken coop and gets them when they're super young. So not really the normal chain of events. I think a dinosaur is much more likely to eat this frog than the other way around, but it could happen. (laughs) Sorry if that was too much talk about frogs, but since it was all over the news, I feel like we needed to address its dinosaur eating ability. (laughs) Yeah, good idea. And again, we have another honorable mention for the most unusual dinosaur predator. We also have a piece of news that is about some pterosaurs, and we usually don't talk about them since they're not dinosaurs. But in this case, there's a link, but I don't want to spoil it, so you'll find out later. In the Cretaceous, (laughs) there's a large chunk of Romania that used to be an island called Hateg, and on it was an Asdar kid called Hazteg Opteryx. If you don't remember Asdarkids, because I didn't know what they were before either, they're basically like Quetzalcoatlus and these other huge pterosaurs. So this one in particular that was recently found seemed to have a beefier neck than some of the other (laughs) Asdarkids. Asdarkid on steroids. Yeah. So they wanted to see just how powerful it would have been as a predator And ultimately, they ended up showing that it had an even stronger, although maybe slightly shorter neck than previously thought. And it would have been shorter than a giraffe, although kind of in a similar posture, potentially, given its quadrupedal stance on land. You know, they kind of walked on their hands that were halfway down their wings and then their hind feet. And then with their strong, powerful neck and big, powerful skull, it has the potential to have been the apex predator on Hateg Island, meaning that within Europe, some of the islands may have been dominated by pterosaurs and not dinosaurs. Interesting. Yeah. I thought that was kind of cool. I really enjoy the idea of both frogs and pterosaurs eating dinosaurs. It's just so crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, some dinosaurs were always food. Yeah, I guess so. Moving on to amber, because you can't talk about dinosaur fossilization without talking about amber, thanks to Jurassic Park. We have our best amber dinosaur find. And with the naked eye, really what you see in the amber is this really striking bird foot near the surface of the amber, and it's almost white. Mm -hmm. It looks really cool, like a hawk foot or something, although very small, but it's got pretty sharp talons on it. And then with a CT scanner, they were really surprised because all of a sudden they could see about half of the body of a full bird. They could see most of a skull, beak, and neck, a partial wing, a full set of primitive flight feathers, even though it's unclear whether or not it could fly, 
as well as part of a leg and then that foot sticking out near the surface. So a pretty complete baby bird. Well, <laughs> it's cute because it's a baby. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an enantiornith, which means that it's on the kind of true bird path. You know, it's within aves and it had tiny teeth in its beak, which is kind of creepy looking. It almost makes it look like it has a serrated beak or something. They think that the bird was probably less than two weeks old based on some of the molting pattern it has going on and then also just how small and undeveloped it looks. But it does look precocial, which basically means that it was probably able to fend for itself. Yeah, it's got teeth and all. Yeah. We talked about precocial dinosaurs a little bit with sauropods and how they're basically like miniature versions of the adults and they could kind of do their own thing. And it looks like this bird probably could too. Interestingly, it has more feathers than we'd see on a modern bird of its age. And that might mean that it was out on its own earlier than modern birds and then getting stuck in amber. And Oh, it didn't know enough. Yeah. <laughs> And that kind of helps us because if they're just waiting in a nest, they're unlikely to get, you know, trapped in amber. They'll probably either get eaten or nothing, but if they start wandering out into the big bad world, <laughs> they can get trapped. It's estimated to be about 99 million years old, and they nicknamed it Balone after a local type of bird. With really close-up microscopy, they can see really tiny feathers on its feet, and they almost look translucent, although they think while it was live, they were probably white. There are also feathers preserved on other parts of the body where they can see some that were likely brown and dark gray. So they got a little bit of information about the potential pattern of colors on the bird. And like I said, unfortunately, only part of it is preserved. And the other part was probably either eaten by something or it might have just eroded since it wasn't fully covered in amber. Poor baby bird. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't last very long. And last year we had both a tail and some wings from dinosaurs. So it's cool that this is continuing. And I believe that they mentioned they have more amber to publish in the years to come. So that'll be awesome to see what else they have in store. Up next, we have the best paleopathology study. What they found was several pathologies in a specimen of Bonitasaura, which is a titanosaur from Argentina. Specifically, on the femur, they found a bony outgrowth, which <laughs> they said could have been caused by three things. Trauma, an infection, or a tumor. And in this case, they think that the tumor is most likely due to kind of lack of other evidence that you'd see typically with trauma or an infection in the area. They also found an abnormal growth on a metatarsal, which is that part of the foot I was talking about earlier. And they said that there were two potential causes of this abnormal growth. It could have been an osteochondroma, which is a benign growth, which is often from cancer, or an enthesophyte, I think is how you say it, which is a bony projection along a tendon or ligament attachment point. And we've mentioned those before. They're kind of what they describe as cauliflower-like growths, which just is so gross. But it's caused by either a disease or by repetitive stress injuries. And they think that it's most likely that it's a repetitive stress injury because there aren't any other diseased cauliflower growths in the area, which seems to mean that it's probably repetitive stress. The last paleopathology is on a tail vertebra, and there there's some bone inflammation, which was probably caused by an infection. And the way they know that it was probably an infection is that there's a new pore that opened up for drainage. It's also pretty gross, but I guess, you know, pathologies tend to be. They said, quote, bone infections occur when pathogenic organisms invade the bone, such as bacteria, viruses, parasites, etc., end quote. So apparently something nasty got into the tail of this dinosaur and started causing trouble. The researchers say that it's the first report of multiple pathologies in a titanosaur and that it would have limited the locomotor capabilities of the animal. So 
Not a great time to be a Bonita Sora, apparently, but pretty interesting. It's always kind of cool to see how much information we can get out of these bones, especially when a lot of the bones are incomplete or otherwise deformed by fossilization, that we can find these little tiny details and learn about just what was going on while the dinosaur was alive. Everybody loves a good paleopathology. Maybe slightly less popular are track sites, but we do have a really cool new track site, especially thanks to Ricardo via Patreon for sharing some new information. Next, we have a follow-up on the Italian tracks we talked about on the top of Mount Pelmo a couple episodes ago, and I had mentioned I have no idea how these were found because I didn't mention in the paper, but luckily Ricardo shared with us on Patreon some information about it. He said, Hi guys, in episode 151 you mentioned an article concerning the discovery of a track site in the Italian Alps. As a native speaker, I had a chance to read some local newspapers and other websites about this. According to local sources, the discovery actually dates back to the early 80s, I'm assuming 1980s. <laughs> Vitorino Cassetta from Selva di Cadore, a renowned ski town in northern Italy, was hiking in that area when he recognized possible tracks. A self-proclaimed paleontologist, his explanation of the origin of these depressions in the rock was not believed until recently because the rocks formed from a seabed. Hmm. Apparently the dinosaur, probably a Coelophysis, was strolling on the shoreline. The modern reinterpretation stirred some interest in the community. Enzo Procopio, a filmmaker from the nearby city of Treviso, pulled off a small project to popularize the finding. Together with the local artist Moro Lampo Olivato, he shot some footage and took photographs of the area. Mr. Olivato also created a wooden dinosaur nicknamed Ebelis that can be seen from the distance to mark the spot. So I guess that's still up there. He sent us some cool pictures showing this wooden dinosaur up by the tracks. I can't imagine it would last that long out in the snow and everything because it looks looks relatively flimsy considering they had to haul all that wood up to the top. <laughs> it looks like it's in good shape. It does. Also, the photographer, as Ricardo pointed out, has a great name, Francesco Soro. Yeah. <laughs> he also sent us a link to a hiking guide, and we'll post that in case you're ever in the northeastern Italian Alps. Looking for some dinosaurs. Or wooden dinosaurs. Could be. I don't know <laughs> if it'll still be there a year from now. Oh, even. yeah, you never know. But thanks, Ricardo. That was really cool to see. Yeah, thank you. Closing out our dinosaur papers, we have the best extinction papers. It only makes sense. Next up, we have two articles about the Chicxulub impact. And they kind of conflict a little bit. So I had to dive pretty deep into them. <laughs> the first one was written by Kaiho and Oshima and published in Nature's Scientific Reports. And thanks to Ian for sharing this with us via Patreon. So Sabrina mentioned a couple months ago how the Chicxulub impact site hit in an area with really high sulfur and how if it had struck 15 minutes earlier or later, it might not have hit that point and it might not have caused the mass extinction. And I think that was kind of a preface to this paper. And it, dinosaurs being very unlucky. Yes, <laughs> a little bit. So this really digs into the math and the science of it, which is what we're all about. So as you probably remember from Sabrina's news story, if you hit a high sulfur area with an asteroid, it shoots a lot of sulfur up into the upper atmosphere not too surprising. And what happens is when sulfur is in the upper atmosphere, it reflects a lot of solar radiation, which can lead to pretty significant global cooling and therefore extinctions if it cools enough. But these researchers also looked at the soot that was released at the impact site. They estimate that about 1,500 teragrams of black carbon oh. were released and a teragram. It's quite the gram. <laughs> yeah, it's the first time I've seen teragrams. A lot of times it's in gigatons. So there's a thousand teragrams to a gigaton. 
So 1,500 teragrams is the same as 1.5 gigatons. Both are pretty difficult to fathom. They actually, in the paper, mentioned that if 1,500 teragrams got shot up into the atmosphere, they estimate that 350 teragrams would have stayed in the upper atmosphere. A lot of it kind of rains back down quickly, but that amount would stay there for at least a year. And 350 teragrams, they describe as 150 times the volume of a baseball arena covered by a full roof. Ooh. So if you've ever been in a baseball stadium and you imagine filling it and then doing that 150 times, you have to spread that out in the upper atmosphere everywhere. And the way the upper atmosphere works is since it's so far on the boundary of the Earth, the stratosphere, basically, it reflects a lot more effectively than if you have the same particulate lower down because it basically shields it at the outermost <laughs> layer. Hmm. From their study, they found that hydrocarbon-rich areas, basically areas that would have produced this 350 teragrams, cover about 13% of Earth. So there was about a 1 in 8 chance of the asteroid hitting that point. So yeah, a little bit unlucky. <laughs> Although it's hard to say there might have been other impacts that we just don't know about because they just hit the ocean. So maybe that happened 20 times before this one hit <laughs> and they're actually lucky. Hmm. We'll never know. <laughs> I guess. Their analysis showed that, like I said, with 1,500 teragrams being released, 350 teragrams would make it to the upper atmosphere. And after about two years, they think there'd still be about 250 teragrams up there, which is way more than I thought. Conventional wisdom is basically that the soot-type particles wouldn't stay in the upper atmosphere as long as things like the sulfur would. But they even showed that after four years, about 100 teragrams would still be in the upper atmosphere. And that means that it would have taken about 10 years for the soot to kind of finally get out of the upper atmosphere and for temperatures to recover. They estimated just from the soot alone, the Earth would have cooled about 8 to 10 degrees Celsius or 14 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's as a global average surface temperature. And then if you are just talking about land, which is what we're really concerned about for dinosaurs, you add on another 8 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit of dropping. So you're down to effectively a 30 degree Fahrenheit drop. Mm. So if you're in an area that's usually 60 degrees. That's a big difference. Now it's below freezing the whole time. Yeah, so not good. They also estimated a 65 to 80 percent drop in precipitation on land. Because without these temperature differentials, it doesn't drive as much of the water cycle. And obviously, if you stop watering your plants regularly, they die. So that's not great. I mean, they're already not getting sunlight, so they're probably dead anyway, and it's cold. But, you know, just, just in case. <laughs> they did say that sulfur could also have a really significant impact on the climate, but only 1 to 2 percent of Earth has a high enough sulfur content to create this sort of temperature change from the sulfur in it. It appears that the place where the Chicxulub impactor hit, it, you know, Chicxulub, was one of these places. <laughs> That's more like a 1 in 50 chance. Also pretty bad luck. But they say that most of the ejected sulfur would probably turn into acid rain, and only about 3% of the sulfur released would have reached the upper atmosphere. On the other hand, the soot, you know, where I said 350 teragrams out of 1,500 made it to the upper atmosphere, that's more like 23% staying up there, so significantly less with the sulfur. Their sulfur calculations had really big error bars compared to the soot, too. They were basically saying it could be from a 0 to 13 degree Celsius change, <laughs> so it's really hard to tell, and I think it's because of that uncertainty about how much of the sulfur would have actually made it to the upper atmosphere. And it actually matters what type of sulfur forms when the impactor hits. If it's sulfur dioxide versus trioxide, it has a huge difference on the impact on the climate. So they kind of emphasize that this combination of hydrocarbon and sulfur-rich impact site is very rare, you know, basically 1% to 2% of the Earth, and therefore dinosaurs kind of unlucky. But they think that the hydrocarbons, or the soot, probably had a bigger impact than the sulfur, which is something we haven't really heard recently. They were talking about that 
back in like the 80s and 90s, they talked about the ash blocking out the sun. But lately, there's been a lot more talk about sulfur. So it's kind of interesting to hear the soot being discussed again. Mm -hmm. And typically, scientists estimate about 8 to 10 degrees Celsius is the requirement for mass extinction. And the soot alone was enough for that. So... Yeah, they didn't even really need the sulfur, according to these calculations. That <laughs> was it was just, a double whammy. Yeah, just icing on the cake. And that might have been part of the reason that there was all this extinction going on in the oceans, because the oceans are a little bit less susceptible to some of these temperature changes. So the 8 to 10 degrees on average is like 16 degrees on land and maybe only 6 degrees in the ocean or something like that. So if you can ramp it up to 20 degrees... <laughs> On average, then the ocean is making it up into that 8 to 10 degree range and everything's going extinct. The other paper that talked about the Chicxulub impactor came from Geophysical Research Letters. And thanks to Damien via Facebook for sharing this one with us. The lead author on this one was Natalia Artemieva. And it was also written in conjunction with, they're listed as an author, Expedition 364 Science Party. <laughs> Interesting. And that's the one that Sean Gulick co-led that we talked about with drilling into the peak ring down in Mexico. Mm -hmm. We interviewed him a few months ago, maybe a year ago now. Most of this paper, it takes a completely different approach than the paper we just talked about. They're mostly talking about the projectile physics from the impact itself. So they're looking at the size, the speed, and the angle of the impact. And they estimated that about 300 gigatons of sulfur was ejected fast enough to reach the upper atmosphere. Now compare that to the earlier paper, which estimated between half a ton and three gigatons of sulfur. Hmm. It's two orders of magnitude. You don't usually see that level of difference between papers coming out so close together. They also estimated that 425 gigatons of carbon dioxide was emitted by the impact, which is 11 times last year's total human edition last year apparently humans made about 38 gigatons of carbon dioxide so in basically in a single instant is 11 years worth of <laughs> modern civilization carbon dioxide output and they said that the carbon dioxide wouldn't have had enough of a global warming effect to counter the cooling effect of the sulfur but it would have increased long-term warming trends and more importantly for a mass extinction point of view would have led to some pretty significant ocean acidification. So the first paper was talking more about soot, and then this one's more focused on the sulfur? Yeah, this paper didn't mention soot at all, actually. And then the, f <laughs> But the first one didn't mention any of the physics of the impact. So it really <laughs> seems like these people should have been working together. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they will in a future paper. Yeah, neither of the papers referenced any of the authors from the other paper, from what I could tell. So it's like they're well, they just... They came out around the same time. They right? did, but... Sometimes authors will be working on the same type of thing for a while, and so they'll reference that author, but just in a different paper. Mm -hmm. So hopefully they end up working together. So a few of the differences between the two papers, the Kaiho article, which was the first one we talked about, used a nine kilometer diameter asteroid, whereas this Artemieva article used a 12.2 kilometer diameter asteroid, which is a huge difference. Mm -hmm. If you think about the volume and the mass and the momentum and everything, that makes a really big difference. The specifics of this article that focused on the physics of the impact estimated 2,500 gigatons of asteroid impacting at 18 kilometers a second, or about 40,000 miles an hour, <laughs> at a 60 degree angle. So the closer it is to 90 degrees, the bigger impact it has. So that's pretty bad. The Artemieva article didn't mention at all the different forms of sulfur. So that might account for a lot of this difference since the first article estimated only 3% of it reaching. That's basically two orders of magnitude and difference right there. And then since they were using a smaller impactor, I'm sure that made a big difference. Most of the coverage of these papers was focused on the second article, probably because that was the group that was down drilling in Mexico. So they're definitely working with more new information. And they say in the paper that they think temperatures dropped more than 20 degrees Celsius or 36 degrees Fahrenheit and took over 30 years to recover. Ooh. 
compared with 10 years and more like 10 to 15 degrees in the other paper. But that was based on the Brugger et al. paper that we talked about earlier, where they said basically all of the land on Earth was below freezing for several years. And they were using 100 gigatons of sulfur as their justification for how that temperature drop would occur. And basically these authors said, well, 100 gigatons is about a third of 300 gigatons, and therefore it must be significantly colder. They didn't go any farther into their math than that, which I think the first paper crew could help out with a lot. <laughs> so I'm seeing some opportunities for collaboration. <laughs> you tell them, Garrett. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard. You know, they're on different, they're probably on different continents and definitely in different research groups and all sorts of things, but they definitely have different skills. Even though they are kind of conflicting papers, they, differ in their exact temperatures and all that kind of stuff. They both point to extreme temperature drops of more than 10 degrees Celsius, which would be enough for a mass extinction, and a recovery period that lasted at least 10 years that obviously is long enough to wipe out tons of animals and plants. It's just the mechanisms that are different, and like I said, neither of them cite one another, so it's unclear how they're receiving the other paper. but. Hopefully we kind of nail down a little bit more about the sulfur because it seems like that's still a big question mark of just how much the sulfur would impact the temperature change. And here's our best dinosaur class of the year. Next up, thanks to Patrick for sharing this with us on Facebook. There's a new course on edx.org by the University of Hong Kong called Dinosaur Ecosystems. And the course focuses on part of the Gobi Desert in early on China, which is by the border with Mongolia. It's like right by the border, like a few feet away from the border. It's crazy. They showed it on a map. Anyway, they also visit various museums like the American Museum of Natural History throughout the course to kind of give you a overview of some of the different dinosaurs and ecosystems that went on back in the Cretaceous. That's cool. Yeah. And the course is designed to be six weeks long, and it's mostly composed of short videos with simple multiple choice answers after the videos. And it looks like there's some longer answers you can give at the end of chapters. So like at the end of the week, I haven't gotten to the end of a week yet, so <laughs> I haven't tried them out yet. And I think you could probably skip it if you don't want to go through all the grading process. The course is in English, but it also has subtitles available in Mandarin, both traditional and simplified, which I was thinking might be a good way to learn Mandarin, since that's something we've been trying to do. <laughs> you could learn how to say all the dinosaur names before anything else. <laughs> <laughs> that's useful. It's the important stuff, really. <laughs> the course is led by Dr. Michael Pittman and Dr. Xu Xing, who we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast before, because he's... We've met him. Yeah, and he's an author on a ton of papers in China. You can take the course for free or you can pay $50 for a certificate. So it's pretty similar to those University of Alberta Coursera courses. And I've started taking it for free and it's been really great so far. They've got lots of information. It's well produced. It keeps you engaged because it does short little like five to 10 minute videos. And then they ask you a couple questions about it and then you kind of switch gears often so you're not falling asleep like you would be watching a lecture potentially. So quick follow-up, we got to see a poster about the Dinosaur Ecosystems course and just how many people they taught using the massively open online course format. So we know it was a very successful course, which is great because it's a really good way to learn about dinosaurs. We also have a best new website for 2017. There's a new interactive map that aggregates just a huge number of paleontology finds all over the world. And they even claim that it's, you know, most of the paleontology finds. And after looking at it, every paleontology find that I know of specifically, I could find on the map. So you can filter it by any time range. For instance, you could do the Mesozoic, you could do just the Cretaceous, or you could even go all the way down to the Maastrichtian, which is the very end of the Cretaceous and when a lot of people's favorite dinosaurs like Triceratops and T-Rex were around. Or you can do it by any taxa. You can do Dinosauria. 
You could do Theropoda or you could do Tyrannosaurids or Tyrannosaurus specifically. And you can even do a specific strata. Like you could just look at all the dinosaurs in the Hell Creek or just everything that's in the Hell Creek formation, marine fossils included. Oh, that would have helped the Saurian team. Yeah, it's a super helpful tool. And you can combine all of those too. So I was looking at dinosaurs from the Maastrichtian in the Hell Creek. There's a lot of overlap there, but <laughs> it's really fun and powerful to go through this. And like I said, it's all over the world. So you can go anywhere, Africa, Europe, Asia, North America, South America, Antarctica, Australia. I think that's all of them. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds a lot like what the Phil J. Curry Museum up yeah. in Alberta were building. Like they yeah. hadn't quite finished their map, but they were doing something similar. Yeah, we were playing with that there. They had a fun version that was a lot like this. Although I think theirs was pretty much just dinosaurs. I'm not positive about that. Oh, yeah, I think you're right. But you might have been able to filter and add other things, too. It was a really similar map, though, and really cool. Theirs also was a little bit more user-friendly because they have pictures on theirs. This one usually just links you to an article or tells you the source that it's in. And sometimes it doesn't even have the name of the dinosaur. So you have to kind of know what you're looking for to get the best use out of it. But it's still super useful because it, it links to what author discovered it and what year and all that kind of stuff. So you can always trace back if you need to. I was playing with it for maybe 10, 15 minutes. And I finally found That's it. it. Yeah. It, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't take long to find everything that you can think of. It's such an easy thing to use. And I finally found exactly where in California the dinosaurs were found because I've been wondering, but it's kind of difficult to narrow that down. It's hard to search through literature for things like that. But when you have a map and you're just interested in one state, you just zoom in on that state, you pick your dinosaurs, and then there you go. They're right there. If you're interested in seeing what kind of dinosaurs are near you or what kind of fossils are near you, it's really fun to go in there and zoom in by your house. I did that too. Unfortunately, <laughs> by our house, there's no good dinosaurs, but there are a lot of marine fossils because we're on the coast in California. So we were just, you know, in the ocean <laughs> back in the Mesozoic. So yeah, a lot of fun though. It's really cool to look around at all the different sites. And it also really shows why... The place to be if you're interested in dinosaur fossils in North America is that Montana, Colorado, Alberta kind of region because they give those dots that grow in size depending on the number of finds. Mm -hmm. And that area is just solid, you know, peppered with them. <laughs> and most of the rest of the U.S. is pretty empty. And this website was created by the Paleobiology Database Navigator by the University of Wisconsin at Madison, my home state. No bias there. <laughs> well, it's awesome because you can just pick out exactly where you are and see what dinosaurs were found nearby. That's true. Or any other fossils. Highly recommended. Moving into the media, we have our best book. Fiction. Yeah. <laughs> it's important to make the distinction. And obviously it has to be Dragon Teeth. Michael Crichton's possibly final book. You never know. They just keep coming out. He was prolific. Yeah, even though he's been gone for like a decade. <laughs> and we're not going to play the review of it. It's like a half hour long, but it's in episode 136 if you want to go listen to it. Full of spoilers, but we definitely recommend reading it. Potentially on Audible, our sponsor. <laughs> and we also have a best book of nonfiction. Which... Can't be too surprised if you've been listening. It's the sauropod dinosaurs, life in the age of giants. You can guess who chose this winner. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the interview in episode 161 with the authors where we go into a lot of the details about the book if you want more information. Yes. That's the last episode if you're listening to these in order. Apatosaurus, <laughs> yes. We also have a best board game. The Bone Wars card game that we got a chance to play. It was made by Zygote Games, apparently back in 2005, according to the box. Yeah, it's been around for a while. Yeah, and if you couldn't guess, it's about the Bone Wars between Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope back in the late 1800s when they were out west in America trying to find the most dinosaurs and describe them super rapid fire. They did a lot of research for this game. I was impressed. Yeah, they got pretty much everything right. There are a couple of minor things that I have 
problems with. But. Well, they probably had to keep it general <laughs> to make sure the game was still fun. Yeah. So the whole idea is that, well, it's for two to four players, and there are three phases to the game. You take turns in out in the field, which is when you collect your dinosaur bones and different cards. And then there's a museum phase where you're assembling your dinosaur bones if you can. And then there's a controversy phase where basically you try to mess up everybody else's dinosaur skeletons. Yeah, that one's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's definitely the most to do in the controversy phase. And then they have cards that you collect that are either fossils, so things like coprolites, or they call them bones, which is limb bones, vertebrae, and skull bones, and they're different colors, and they're meant to be, I mean, they all add up to actual dinosaurs, but they kind of group them by if they're theropod or... Thyreophora, which is ankylosaurus and stegosaurus, basically. Mm -hmm. And sauropods and seropoda. Yeah, and seropoda, that's one of the things that I think is weird because it's not really a term that anybody uses. It's, I think this is the first time I encountered the term. I had to look it up. It basically is a combination of ornithopoda and ceratopsians. So when I looked at it, because the first one I got was a ceratopsian, I was like, do they mean ceratopsia? But no, they combined those two for some weird reason. But then they have thyreophora separate. So I don't know what that's about. I think they should have just split them up a little bit more. <laughs> Maybe it got too complicated that way. I suppose. So you're collecting these bone and fossil cards, and you also collect these dinosaur name cards, so like Camarasaurus, for example. And hopefully, by the time you get to the museum phase, you have enough of the right Camarasaurus bones to put it together. And you put it down and you say, this is my dinosaur. And then in the controversy phase, people can say, no, that skull is wrong or something like that. And then the thing with the controversy phase is you can throw down because you're trying to get to a set number of agreed points beforehand. So if you just want to try to grab some points, you can throw down some really crappy dinosaur and just kind of make a last ditch effort that obviously doesn't match because they're color coded. So it could just be like all different colors and everything. But then someone could correct you and then you lose a bunch of points. So there's kind of like this risk reward to putting down dinosaurs that are really well done, but you might get less points for it because you're really careful about which ones you use versus just throwing down a bunch of cards that give you some quick points, which is kind of the fun balancing act of the game. Yeah. And you can play, since it's two to four players, you can play as either Cope, Marsh, Barnum Brown, or Charles Sternberg. And your card has like a little bit of information about each of these men. But what I really like about the game and what makes me think that they did a lot of research is that most of the cards have a quote from an actual paper or newspaper article or something a paleontologist from the 1800s said. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah, so it was a pretty fun game. We played it with four people and it seemed to work pretty well. I'm not sure how fun it would be with two people. It seems like it might be a little bit contentious since there's that controversy phase where you're messing with people's dinosaurs all the time. I got contentious with four people. A little bit, yeah. I was happy because I got the Ankylosaurus card, although I built it mostly out of Stegosaurus parts. <laughs> yeah, you do what you can. Yep. It was a little hard for me to play because I know you can play putting down the wrong parts, but I kept looking at it like, oh, this is really wrong. Yeah. And I could spot it from like across the board. So there would be a theropod and I'd be like, oh, it's got T-Rex arms yeah. or like, oh, that one's got a triceratops head when it's supposed to be a styracosaurus or whatever. So I think that gave us a bit of a disadvantage. We were playing with people who are not as enthusiastic about dinosaurs. I thought it gave me an advantage. Oh. But then again, I ended up winning. Yeah. So, I thought it was, it held me back. <laughs> I didn't want to take too many risks. Maybe it held you back, but it gave me an advantage somehow. That's weird. <laughs> so yeah, it's a fun card game. Yep. Good to do on a rainy day or a, a heat wave day, which is how we played it. Yep. You definitely need a table, though. It's not something you could really play in a car because you have to lay out your quote unquote museum in front of you with all your dinosaurs. So we ended up taking up a fairly decent size of a table to play it. It was actually not released in 2017, but it's when we played it, so we're just going to pretend like it is. <laughs> well, same goes with the Sauropod Dinosaurs book. It was published in 2016, but good point. Yeah. we read it and enjoyed it and got to talk with the creators <laughs> in 2017. <laughs> yes. And we have an honorable mention for the best board game, which is Go Extinct, the kids game. So 
if you're looking for a younger audience, it's definitely a better choice. And we have an interview with Ariel Marcy in episode 124, all about that game. Next up, we have Best New Video Game. Island 359 is out for VR on both Rift and Vive. I just tried playing it, and it has two modes. There's Arcade and Mercenary. And Arcade mode is basically an endless stream of dinosaurs trying to kill you. So (laughs) you basically stand there with an unlimited amount of ammo shooting at them. And you do have to reload, which is problematic because there's an endless stream of dinosaurs running at you. And that is how I died every time. (laughs) It, It starts with dinosaurs that are really small. They're bigger than Compsognathus, but... Not quite as big as Coelophysis. I don't really know what they were going for. Maybe some kind of Ornithomimid. And they kind of like chirp, sort of, and they run over to you. And it's helpful that they all make a lot of noise before they're attacking you, even though they're hunting. And like we've said before, dinosaurs definitely didn't make noise when they were hunting. (laughs) After the Coelophysis and Compsognathus hybrid comes after you for a little while, it moves up to quote-unquote raptors, which are basically featherless Utah raptors and very similar to the Jurassic Park velociraptors. And I was on easy mode, so I made it through the first quote-unquote hour, but it's really like a minute. They just say, like, you survived the first hour. And then I died very quickly in the second hour because a raptor jumped on top of me, and I didn't realize that they could jump now. (laughs) So I assume that if I had survived a little bit longer, eventually a T-Rex would have shown up because... They use T-Rex in some of their artwork. And really the only reason I even survived as long as I did is that the raptors are always like screeching and everything's yelling when it's coming over to you. And they come from all different sides. So you have to keep like spinning around trying to shoot at them. (laughs) That sounds tiring. (laughs) It's very scary, actually. It's pretty intense. I did the beach scene because that seemed the least scary rather than like the deep woods (laughs) It was still intense. I had to turn the volume down because it was like freaking me out with all these like roaring dinosaurs. On the beach scene, do you have to worry about stuff coming up from the water? I mean, you're pretty far from the water. You're probably like a couple hundred feet away. Then in mercenary mode, there are two options. One looks really similar to the arcade, except you roam around to find more guns. And I think you get like paid depending on how many of them you shoot or something like that. And then the other one is a big hunt (laughs) where you have a bow and an arrow and you try to hunt what I think is a triceratops. And that reminded me of that picture on Facebook of Steven Spielberg sitting next to the sick triceratops and someone Mm. jokingly posted like that he was a hunter that killed it and everyone was all outraged. Yeah. So you can relive that thing that never happened. (laughs) (laughs) So I managed to sneak up on the triceratops without getting attacked by the raptors, which are kind of around it. And that's what you're supposed to do. And then I have a bow and arrow, and there's a triceratops that's freaking enormous. So I shot it with a couple of arrows, and then it immediately killed me in exactly the way you'd expect a triceratops to kill somebody. It just charged me and hit me with its horns. Mm. I was also on easy in that mode. I don't know what... It's like, I I don't know, maybe I'm just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but the game is pretty hard. I can't imagine how hard the other difficulties must be. The game does have a few clever details, like when you ride in a chopper, you can stick your head into a bucket and you'll skip the animation. (laughs) So it's like if you're getting sick, you'd skip it. And I will say that since I was playing on an Oculus Rift and I only have two sensors, it's designed to have you always facing the same direction. And this game really doesn't work with that. You can technically use the thumbstick to turn around so you could stay facing the same direction in the room the whole time and it would work with two sensors but when you're in vr it's really hard to keep track of when you need to turn so that you're facing the right way in the room so really you should get another sensor and do the whole room scale thing that's an option now i think it's probably worth it it was 13 dollars in the oculus store it's on sale right now it's 20 dollars on steam still pretty cheap and it's early access which means there are still some bugs but it worked actually really smoothly for me i didn't have any major problems Unless maybe it's not supposed to be that hard. I don't know. (laughs) Couldn't tell you. Yeah, Sabrina will never play this game. Never? I don't know about never. Do you want hordes of angry dinosaurs running at you? No, not really. This game is really great, especially when you get room scale. Highly recommended. And we'd like to give an honorable mention to Saurian, but it's not finished yet, so it's not really a full released title. 
Sorian is out in early access. Woo, we've been waiting. <laughs> yep. Yes, we have. We're not the only ones. It costs $20 and it's still very early in development. So you might remember we've done a couple of interviews with the team and ultimately you'll be able to play as Dakota Raptor, Triceratops, Pachycephalosaurus, and T-Rex. And then later Anzu and Ankylosaurus will be added. Oh, Ankylosaurus. Yeah, that, those were the two that won the voting I remember Anzu. I didn't remember Ankylosaurus. How could you forget I'm Ankylosaurus? I'm sorry. Ooh. How could I? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't orange enough. It is orange, actually. Oh, darn. <laughs> so all you can play as now is Dakota Raptor, and you start as a baby, as you will with all of the animals. And you can either decide to stick with a parent. When you are born, there are two parents right next to you, and they both kind of run off in different directions oh, immediately. Sad. Yeah. But since there's a little, there are little pop-ups in the corner that kind of give you hints about what dinosaur life is like and sort of suggestions. And it says, since Dakota Raptors are good parents, you can stay near them and they won't attack you while you're still young. That's what it means to be a good parent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, they don't actually try to stay near you at all. Maybe in future updates, the parents will actually try to protect you a little bit. That would be nice. But I'm not holding my breath. Because um, that seems like, you know, it might make the game a little too easy. So basically, the first time I did it, I didn't realize that little tip and the parents ran off. And then I ran around trying to kill little lizards and then eventually got killed by something else. So then I decided, okay, I got to stick with the parents. And that made it a little bit easier to get food when one of the adult Dakota Raptors would kill something and you kind of share with it a little bit. It wouldn't you know, freak out at you for sharing. But the other dinosaurs still kill you pretty much immediately because you're really small, including even things that aren't that aggressive like Pachycephalosaurus. They and know you'll be a threat someday. I guess so. And it's like, you know, if you try to bite at them, then they just, they got no time for that. And that's probably realistic because like you say, you're sort of a threat. But the animation isn't really quite there yet on some of the killing things. So sometimes it's like, you die, but it's like it barely even turns around and you're like, oh, that was kind of anticlimactic. And one other problem I had was I was following an adult because I decided that was my best chance at survival. I yeah. need an adult. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it got stuck in a river. It was just kind of like swimming in circles. So I tried to nudge it and then it just immediately killed me <laughs> for nudging it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that wasn't great and then another time i was taking with the adult all it did was eat little lizards all over the place and so you can't share those with it so then i died of hunger mm. you can make it up one age level without eating at all and you'll be like mostly starved to death by the time you level up but <laughs> it's possible the problem is once you level up it looked like because it gave me a little tip about how you could jump on things and kill them now I was trying to kill a Pachycephalosaurus, but it would walk faster than I could because I was like, you know, all gimpy from dying. And then I died while like trying to track down this Pachycephalosaurus. That's pretty realistic. <laughs> yeah. In order to play the game right now, you need a really powerful computer. I recently upgraded our computer for VR and it still chugs a little bit, especially at like dawn and dusk when the shadows are moving a lot. You have to pay a lot of attention to how much water and food you have. And you also have a gauge for stamina and thirst. The stamina one's also really important because that's what goes down when you run and jump. So if you're trying to keep up with your parent because they go super fast, you're basically like chasing them like, no, don't leave me because they just kind of like randomly run all over the place until they get stuck on trees and things like that. And then you can catch up. <laughs> you have to like pay attention to this because if you wear your stamina all the way down, then you have to stop and rest for a little while and it can be hard to catch up. Luckily, the Dakota Raptors have white heads, which makes them a little bit easier to pick out in the forest, but they're still kind of hard to spot. You can also save the game, which uses some water and food and then skips ahead eight hours. And watching other dinosaurs is really fun because sometimes they interact and like fight each other. There's a big, I think, Sarcosuchus or some kind of big alligator type thing that sometimes attacks some of the dinosaurs. So that's kind of fun. They'll battle a little bit. 
And it has this really fun game mechanic, which is a smell indicator. So you press the smell button and then these little like pheromone clouds pop up all over the place so that you can see where like predators or potential prey are. And that helps you kind of track them down. It worked really well the first time I played it, and then I got an update, which improved a lot of things about the game, so they're obviously working on it pretty hard right now, but it made the smell indicator stop working for me, which made it super hard to hunt, because <laughs> I was looking for these little tiny lizards that are hiding in the brush, and without the smell indicator, you lose track of them really quickly. The thing I enjoy the most about the game is definitely knowing that with all the research that went into it, when I'm exploring this environment as a dinosaur, it's a super realistic version of what Hell Creek was like at the time. That we know of. Yeah, but I mean, that's our best known interpretation, what the science, mm -hmm. the current state of the science. Because usually when I'm playing a game, you kind of wonder like, oh, is that the kind of tree you'd have there? You know, it looks a little bit dry. Why is it so deserty? I thought it was more of a forest. But this is like... You know, they put so much effort into that that you're really kind of experiencing what it was like to be a dinosaur back then. Plus, you're playing as a dinosaur, yep. which is awesome. Usually, it, there are these like survival games where you'll play as a human in sort of a dinosaur-ish place, but you're still playing as a human, so it's a whole different feel to it. It's probably why they have so many fans. Yeah, I think so. Similar to our books, we have a best movie release of the Lost World silent film. The latest remastered <laughs> version, that yes. is, since it did come out in 1925. Yeah, although this one, we did see the screening of it in, you know, its current form was released in 2017. Mm -hmm. So definitely recommend seeing it. You can see older versions for free online too. So like we mentioned, it was during the San Francisco Silent Film Festival and they did a demonstration of nitrate burning in oh, the yeah. beginning. Oh yeah, that was good. That was intense. Yeah, so film used to be made out of nitrate, as some of you probably know, and it's super flammable. There's that movie, what was it, Inglorious Bastards, I think, mm -hmm. showed them using it basically to like burn down a theater intentionally, and that kind of thing actually used to happen. It was really dangerous to store film because it's so flammable, but now they use safety film that doesn't burn because he also gave a demonstration of trying to burn that and it didn't he burn. Did. <laughs> and he seemed much more confident doing that demonstration. He kind of, maybe it was for effect, but he seemed a little nervous when he was doing the nitrate and it burned up so quickly. It did. The reason he did this demonstration was because he was talking about how hard it is to find some of this old film and he mentioned how... There are like a few things that always seem to happen when you're restoring old film. One of them is that you can never find high quality film of something that's worth watching. And if <laughs> yeah. someone's like, I found this nitrate and it's in really good shape, then he's like, oh, that's too bad because it's probably <laughs> really lame. And then he said, and then the other thing is once you finally go through the trouble of restoring a movie from this like lower quality nitrate, you're going to find out that somebody had a perfect preserved copy of it just sitting on the shelf. Which is what happened with The Lost World. <laughs> exactly. So he went through a lot of effort, him and a team, I think, restoring old film reels. And they released a DVD version of The Lost World. In 2005 or so. Yeah. And then shortly after that, they discovered a better version. <laughs> well, somebody reached out to them and said, oh... Yeah. I have these. Would you like it? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, yes, I, I guess. <laughs> I just went through all this work of restoring it, but mm -hmm. sure. I guess kind of fortunately for him, that wasn't a complete reel. There were still some things missing. So they ended up combining multiple reels to get kind of a single best version. And I think it's quite a bit longer because the one we saw, I think, was 90 minutes. There's one on the Internet Archive that's like 70 minutes. And I think that's probably the DVD release. And since it's from 1925, I think it's out of copyright, and that's why it's on the Internet Archive. Mm -hmm. And Wikipedia. Oh, really? You can watch the movie on Wikipedia? Yeah, I found it on <laughs> accident when I was trying to look up some facts. <laughs> that's funny. I guess I did see, I think Gertie is on Wikipedia, too. Oh, good. We should watch that. I've watched it. I thought you watched that one. I have, but I don't remember what happens other than Gertie eats a tree. That's mostly. Mm -hmm. It also, like, throws a rock. But anyway, back to The Lost World. <laughs> While watching it, since it's a silent film, they had a live orchestra, and then they also pumped in some jungle sounds through the speakers when they got to these jungle environments, which was kind of weird because you're like, ah, 
Where is that coming from? The sound. That like, orchestra is really good at making these sound effects. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was thinking for a minute. <laughs> and I think there were even a few dinosaur sounds that they put in there. I don't remember now. Yeah, I think there were, but they might have been like recorded versions of instruments that are like vaguely animal-like. I'm not really sure how they did it because they had a pretty small orchestra there. So they might have just recorded, you know. Yeah, there's only three or four people. Yeah. They did a really good job. They That's did do a great a job. a lot of work. Yeah. And overall, the movie was actually really good. I was surprised at how well it stood up. It had lots of really good stop motion. It was done by Willis O'Brien, like we mentioned, the same guy who did King Kong, but obviously way more dinosaurs. There wasn't anything other than dinosaurs in the stop motion. And he's from Oakland, so when his name came up on the credits, a bunch of people applauded. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was kind of fun. You don't usually see people applauding for like the special effects team on a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there was one character in blackface, so that was kind of... That wasn't great. Not great. That's probably the one thing that doesn't... I wasn't expecting it at all, so it took me a long time to realize that that's what was happening. Yeah, because the film, you know, it's old, old film. And I think in those scenes, they, they would tint the color of the film, depending on if they were inside or outside and if they were in a cave. And I think it was usually the kind of a darker tint when they were showing that character. So like you couldn't really tell. And then you're like, oh, wait a second. That's yeah, that's a little unpleasant. Yeah. But aside from that, all the characters seemed pretty well put together. It was there were a few women characters in it that weren't like typical damsels in distress most of the time. So that was kind of nice. Yeah. They mostly got respect. That's cool. Yeah. The dinosaurs. I liked the stop motion animation The it was interesting, though, the brontosaurus, they basically made its neck snake-like. Oh, yeah. It was all, like, squirmy. Like, its neck, you could tell how they articulated it in the model, like one of those little snakes that you hold by the tail and you make it, like, wiggle back and forth. Yeah, but except it's <laughs> attached to a giant body and tail. <laughs> yeah, the body didn't move much. It was mostly the neck and head. And then it's also snapped at... I just cut Sabrina off because she was doing things I consider spoiling, and she said, it's from 1925. Yeah, I think <laughs> the time is over. <laughs> but I mean, it's it wasn't easily available for like 50 or but 80 years in between. But now it's on Wikipedia, so. It is. So <laughs> if you're interested in watching this, you should watch it, and we'll probably do a review in a future episode. And also, then, I don't think talking about what the dinosaurs did particularly spoils the movie. And then I'll let Sabrina give all these descriptions that she wants to give. <laughs> the spoiler would be telling what the people are doing. I don't know. Not what the dinosaurs are doing. We got to know our audience here. They're mostly interested in what the dinosaurs are doing. Yeah. But in terms of story-wise... <laughs> I guess. Doesn't really affect the plot. Anyway, if you're interested in it, <laughs> give it a watch, and then we'll probably review it sometime in the future. We also have a best video live action category <laughs> there's a video of a 17 month old girl in taiwan and it's of her encountering a sauropod balloon and so in the video her dad walks her over to the balloon but she's scared of it so she starts walking away and then her dad follows her with the balloon and attaches it to her back and then she starts trying to walk run away from the dinosaur she's getting really upset and she asks her mom for a hug and then the dad removes the balloon while he's laughing because it is pretty cute and then picks her up and tells her let papa come and save you <laughs> so the video went viral in taiwan apparently the parents had bought the balloon for their son but then they wanted to film their daughter's reaction when they saw that she was scared <laughs> but don't worry her mom said quote she was fine and slept very well that night yeah, I was thinking, like, that poor girl's going to be traumatized by balloons or nah. dinosaurs or something. Because she looked really panicked. She with did. With it chasing her. Although it wasn't really chasing her, no, but she thought it was. it was cute. <laughs> I'm glad she wasn't scared for too long. Yeah. <laughs> then I can enjoy the video. <laughs> <laughs> Might be kind of mean, but I still think it's pretty cute. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a best video animated of the year, which I think unquestionably goes to the robot chicken clips, even though those, again, might not technically be 2017, I'm not sure. Next, thanks to Chris for sharing this awesome video with us on Facebook. It's from Robot Chicken, and they put together different dinosaur clips from different parts of the show, 
and we'll have the full link in our show notes. But we want to play at least my favorite one. I don't know which one's Sabrina's favorite. I don't think it's the same. Which one's your favorite? You play yours first. Okay. The Velociraptor cages are open. They're the most dangerous dinosaurs of all. They attack in coordinated formations. My God, where did they learn that? Eh, a five, six, seven, eight. First Velociraptor. Good. Second Velociraptor. Yes. Third Velociraptor. Just Third hands. Velociraptor. <laughs> Oh, is that me? Yes, Crystal, you were late again. Can someone get me a petrified mosquito with the DNA of a dinosaur with some rhythm? I'll learn it. Yeah, you better. Oh, and Bartholomew, save some park engineer for the rest of us. Do you want to be fed to a T-Rex? Because you look like a cow. Why are you so mean? Oh, I mean, good one, Crystal. Clever girl. <laughs> Yeah, I, my favorite part of that is that sarcastic, clever, clever girl, girl yeah, with the slow clap. Good. That's definitely the best. I like the one with Robbie Sinclair from Dinosaurs. Oh, yeah, that's a really short one. Yeah. They, like, clone a dinosaur, and it turns out to be Robbie from Dinosaurs. These are even better <laughs> when you see the images that accompany it. So. Yeah, this one's pretty easy to imagine what's going on, like dinosaurs jumping out. Clever girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. So if you want to watch these videos, check out the link in our show notes. And just FYI, Robot Chicken is rated 16 and up. So if you're watching with kids, you know, do it at your discretion. And that's it for our best of. All the categories that we had to fill. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too long. And before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to again thank our sponsor, Audible. As a reminder, they have a ton of audiobooks to choose from, including Dragon Teeth. They don't have the Sauropod book, but you wouldn't want to do that in audio form anyway because it's largely pictures and you'd miss out on all that glory. Mm -hmm. Dragon Teeth only has one or two pictures, so I think you're safe without seeing it. <laughs> we also have our book on there, What Happened to Brontosaurus, and there are lots of other good dinosaur books on there. For example, the original Jurassic Park and the sequel called The Lost World, just like our best film of the year. But different story. <laughs> totally different story. And there are some other gems to be found. So if you're interested in getting into audiobooks, head over to audibletrial.com slash inodino and you can get your free audiobook when you start your trial. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Draco Raptor, which was a request from Mr. Dinosaur via YouTube, so thanks. It was a neotheropod that lived in the early Jurassic in what is now Wales, and its name means dragon thief. And this makes sense because the Welsh flag has a red dragon on it. It was found in 2014 and 2015 by brothers and amateur paleontologists Nick and Rob Hannigan near Penarth in Wales. They were looking for ichthyosaurs and they found boulders with dinosaur bones sticking out of them that had fallen from a cliff face. It's so not a bad find. It was described in 2016 by David Martill, Stephen Vitovic, Cindy Howells, and John Nuds, and Nick and Rob suggested the genus name. The type species is Dracoraptor hannigani, and the species name is in honor of the Hannigan brothers. It was found in the Blue Lias Formation, right between a layer with a Jurassic ammonite and a layer that represents the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. The skull is about two-thirds complete, but was disarticulated, and a juvenile specimen was found, and it was 7 feet or 2.1 meters long. Adults could have grown up to 10 feet or 3 meters long. It was bipedal with a long tail, and it had dagger-shaped serrated teeth. And it had small teeth about 0.4 inches or 1 centimeter long, so it probably ate small lizards and mammals. It had a furcula, which is a wishbone, and it also had long legs and was probably a fast runner. The Dracoraptor specimen probably was washed into sea, but the paleontologist who described it tentatively said it was a quote-unquote shore-dwelling animal. Dracoraptor is the oldest Jurassic dinosaur known so far. It's also the most complete theropod from whales so far. And it's a basal neotheropoda and the most basal coelophysoid. It only had three teeth in the premaxilla, which is a basal trait. And Vitovac said, quote, 
So this dinosaur starts to fill in some gaps in our knowledge about the dinosaurs that survived the Triassic extinction and gave rise to all the dinosaurs that we know from Jurassic Park books and TV. You can also see Draco Raptor at the National Museum Wales in Cardiff. And here's our best fun fact of 2017, I think. And our fun fact of the day is that there are at least a couple accounts of mammals eating non-avian dinosaurs. And I was thinking about that because we had that pterosaur eating a dinosaur, so you wonder, did mammals ever do that? The first that was found, or maybe I should say potentially found because it's a little bit not 100% verified, was Delta Theridium eating an Archaeornithoides in present-day Mongolia. So the mammal, Delta Theridium, was weasel-sized at half a foot or about 15 centimeters long. The evidence isn't great, though, like I mentioned, because basically there's a partial Archaeornithoides skull that was found with the appearance of having been chewed on or possibly eaten by the mammal. The teeth marks and the area seem to match. So it wasn't like found in the stomach. So it's not great evidence. But then the second discovery of a repenomamus with a cetacosaurus found preserved in its stomach is obviously a much more obvious find. And I think Sabrina mentioned this when we were talking about cetacosaurus. So the mammal was about two feet long and likely weighed between four and six kilograms or nine and 13 pounds. And it really looks a lot like an opossum. And it was a pretty similar size to an opossum too which actually made this one of the largest mammals in the Mesozoic. So we didn't get so big back then. (laughs) (laughs) In both cases, the dinosaurs were juveniles, so it's not really as simple as saying mammals feasting on dinosaurs. It's really more (laughs) like opportunistic mammals finding small dinosaurs to prey on. Gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, but really that kind of points to the complexity of you know, biological systems. It's not as simple as just like this one gets the biggest and therefore it always eats the smaller one. Opportunistic hunters can always find a juvenile here or there. An extremely random other fact that I found while looking at opossums is that U.S. President Taft was celebrating his election and he ate a roasted opossum. He was replacing Teddy Roosevelt, who the teddy bear was named after, And so there was a brief attempt to make a quote-unquote Billy Possum to replace the teddy bear. Oh, gosh. and That's not nearly as cute. No, it failed catastrophically. I think that they should have made a dinosaur stuffed animal instead, since in the early 1900s, all these dinosaurs were getting mounted in museums and stuff. Like, they could have made a Taft Rex, maybe. I can't really think of anything else that's even remotely similar. This is quite the tangent. Yeah. (laughs) So anyway, a possum-like animal ate a dinosaur is the the dinosaur fact buried in there. And there should have been a toy called Taft Rex. Yeah, I think so. And it's all connected. It is. (laughs) Yep. Garrett really cracks himself up. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And if you want to join our growing community, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. And send us a note if you want to be included in the Stegosaurus shoutouts and you're above the Stegosaurus level. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.